computer. So hello everyone and uh, welcome to the latest episode of the Black Heart Red Spade podcast. Today I have another special guest on. Uh, it's my friend Tim Bollins who is one of the uh, main writers at uh, Macrodesiac. So for those of you that you who don't know, uh, Macrodesiac is uh, a very, very informative and I would say very well known um, a macroeconomic newsletter, Discord channel, and also, uh, what, how should I say, not, not a trading service, uh, because that's not really what you, what you guys do, but also um, trade idea um, service, if I can call it that. Would that be correct, Tim? Um, yeah, that's, that's one way of putting it, one way of putting it. We just try and give people, kind of just sort of throw information at people, help, you know, help put things in context, but it's not like... Mm a lot of services where it's, you know, follow me, I'm the man, you need to do what I tell you to do because I've already got it figured out. That's, it's the opposite of that. It's all of us trying to figure things out together. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so I, I completely blundered that one. Whoops, my bad, kind of butchered yeah. <laughs> what, it's all, what it's all about. But uh, I, I'm sure anyone listening to this would, would, get the, would get the gist of where I was going with it. And, and I mean, speak, speaking of, uh, of Macrodesiac, you know, it's like, um, I remember you and I were chatting, uh, you know, about how both of us actually got started in the world of finance and that, you know, I, I, I personally don't have a finance degree. Um, the only financial qualifications I have are exams and a lot of self-study and plenty of experience making a lot of mistakes in the market. And you, you told me that you had sold houses in Spain for, what was it, nearly 20 years? Is that correct, man? Yeah, best, best, best part of, yeah. Yeah, I best can give you the kind of- 20 years. Yeah, and then, give you the kind of history there. And then you got into this game yourself. And, you know, your, your newsletters are pretty damn incredible. And I mean, our conversations that we've had have been most insightful about so many topics, far broader than just trading. But I think- the story that you've never told or that I've never come across as your own, as in how you got started. So I'd be curious to know, how did you get started in this uh, field, mate? Um, yeah, I mean, it is. <laughs> OK, I can give a bit of a bit of background. So basically what I did when I I was about 14, 15, my parents decided to come and buy an old farmhouse in Spain. You know, they did the whole dream. You know, let's go and buy, a, you know, an old rundown place in the country in Spain. We'll do it up. We'll retire there. You know, we'll live off the land and, all, you know, all of that sort of nonsense. Um, and it was, you know, it was a complete wreck that they bought. I couldn't believe what they were doing. But obviously, when it came time for me to for them to move here, because their plan was always that they were going to move to Spain when I was old enough to to do my own thing. And I could either come with them, you know, my choice, or I could go go on and do university or whatever, whatever I wanted to do. Um and because I couldn't decide, really, this is this is kind of a bit of a theme. Mm -hmm. I couldn't decide what to do, so I just kind of went with the flow. Um, came out here, you know, the idea was maybe maybe do six months, whatever, uh, and then uh, and then it, you know I just stayed because things just kept. I just kind of keep going out and sort of I don't know, it just sort of being a bit curious about things and asking questions and trying stuff, and it kind of all uh, the path kind of almost like reveals itself in front of me you know I, mean, I only know that when I'm looking back of course so I kind of so after a few months of being there, I didn't speak any Spanish so um so I kind of I met a guy at a local bar another English guy who'd already moved out to the area and bear in mind this is like this isn't Marbella or anything like this Spain this is just proper rural Spain ah, you know we're awesome. about 45 <laughs> awesome. minutes inland all good stories start in the bar don't they have you noticed oh, yeah, that just, yeah they do <laughs> <laughs> always always so he'd been working anyway this guy had been working at this bar um and he'd learned spanish working behind the bar he didn't know much when he was there um and he just you know he just kind of chucked himself into it because there was a few english people coming through you know into the area it was like relatively newly discovered i guess so um so he but he was leaving he had another job to go so i can't remember what it was he was doing and he basically said well why don't you have my job you know i'll put a word in for you and we'll we'll try our best love it um so I obviously not knowing any Spanish, the, the owner couldn't be more Spanish, didn't speak a word of English or anything like that. And just proper country Spaniard, you know, with an accent that would make like the Newcastle accent in England. You know, it's like that's the level of sort of Spanish dialect that you're looking at. Wow, you're kidding me. 
no, 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 proper, you know, proper out there. So he, he gave me a little interview and I, I, I prepared for the interview by trying to figure out the kind of questions he might ask me. And, and, I, and then I prepared answers beforehand. And if I heard the right words, I tried to say the right thing that I'd already prepared and hope for the best. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah, it worked out, you know, because he, he kind of, he just, just about, I mean, he was very, I think he was quite doubtful, you know, that he needed someone and he didn't have anyone else, I think. So <laughs> he gave me the job. Um, and I just chucked myself into it. And at the beginning, I mean, the first day was a disaster. It was like the local market day when all of the, so everyone comes in from all around the areas and comes and buys all the local fresh produce and all this sort of stuff. And I'm behind this bar on my first day and there's all these country folk coming in asking, you know, for their, I mean, because they don't just have normal drinks here. You know, it's not like they have like, oh, I'll, I'll have a black coffee or a white coffee. You know, there's, there's all kinds of coffees that I didn't know. Um, huh. And also I learned how, how many of them have alcohol first thing in the morning, which was a complete revelation to me. You know, they're all there pouring brandy in the coffees and all sorts of stuff like that, which is just like alien world. Wow, so, yeah, talk so just, about just a culture shock. Brilliant. That, that yeah, must have been a massive completely. culture shock to you. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and they, and they, they you know, they mix like aniseed with brandy and, and drink it what? with their coffee as well. Like, yeah, yeah all sorts of really. <laughs> and I just go, what have I got myself into? Damn. You know, but it was a really good way to learn Spanish because I was there in the bar, you know, 12 hours a day, probably, maybe, maybe more some days. And so I always had people to speak to. And there weren't that many English around at the time. There were a few, but there weren't that many. So, you know, I just, that, that was sort of how I learned. I just had a little book behind the bar. I kept sort of trying to figure things out. You know, if people couldn't, you know, if they didn't, didn't know what the, uh, uh, if I didn't know what they said, basically, I'd try and get them to write it down or I'd write it down and say, is this what you said? You know, and then the next day, because they were regulars, they'd come in and I'd know what the rest of the conversation was. And we kind of carry on the conversation one day to the next. So, yeah, mm. yeah it was brilliant. Brilliant. And then from there, a guy came in back in, this is back in the property boom. Yeah. So when everything was just really kicking off around 2000 and what would this be? About 2002, I think it was when I moved there. Yes, it would be. Um, so yeah, back in 2002. So before it really, really sort of, you know, got, got legs, but it was sort of underway. Um, so a guy came in, property developer, building villas, you know, kind of bespoke off plan villas and trying to sell them to, to Brits. Um, again, needed someone who spoke English, gave me a chance. And that's sort of where it all started. You know, I kind of built that, built that with him and ended up working in property for the whole, the whole time from there on in one guise or another. I worked for, I worked for him, I worked for an, an estate agent and also worked for a law firm for a couple of years as well. So I kind of got every angle of how it all worked. Huh. Wow. I, I mean, what a damn story. Uh, in the spirit of having started in a bar, cheers, by the way. I don't know if you can hear my, my bourbon there, but... First time that I'm having a bourbon while doing an interview. Going full on Rogan here by the looks of it. Uh, well, <laughs> m minus the weed and the psychedelics and all that stuff, of course, just uh, saying. But, geez, so, so that's how you got started. I, I mean, wow. Yeah, and completely fell into it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny you say that you kind of fell into it because that's how I feel that I got started in the world of finance. I, I, yeah. I mean, I, I literally just fell into it myself. Um, I mean, the, this isn't about me, but I also just had a serendipitous kind of moment where I met the right person during the right period of my life. And the rest is history. Here I am talking to you. Uh, yep. But but it just shows you how how often that can happen. And, and you know, you I bet you didn't never for the life of you thought that this is where your life would end up. I mean, no. it, yeah, it, it, it's, it, it's actually really remarkable. And, you know, the... the that leads me on to the next part of the progression. You know, it's like you you mentioned to me that that you 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 got into the into the world of finance. You know, and and and, right. and writing and, and writing and all that stuff. Uh, how did that happen? Um, okay, so so let's kind of I suppose I sort of got to set the set the scene, I guess, from from this. So obviously, you're when a good storytelling, mate. So go for it. <laughs> okay. Cheers. So when the when the crash came here and everything, it was obviously it was it was hard times as it was everywhere. But especially, I think, especially where we where we are, because we'd sort of by this time I'd moved down to the coast as well. I'd missed that part out, um, and I got my own place and everything else. But mm. with a big mortgage and all sorts of things, so that that didn't go well. Um, obviously, when property prices went down, and I managed to sort of get myself out of that, 
Um, but it was basically like starting again, you know, and there was insecurity everywhere. And I was just sort of trying to make, make ends meet. And all I really wanted at that time was a stable job. That's what I wanted. And I kind of rode the waves and managed to get a stable job. And, and I helped out with this other, this other guy, Simon. Um, and we, we basically sort of built up his estate agency, which ironically he'd started in 2007. So uh, <laughs> he, he timed that well. Mm. And we managed to sort of build it up again from, you know, on the upside then, you know, working hard. And, uh, and I enjoyed that. And it did bring me, you know, it did bring me a steady wage in and everything else. But it came to a point where I kind of started to get bored with it. And, and if I'm honest entirely, I think I can look back now and kind of pinpoint when that time started, when it, when, when it all started to sort of fall apart, I guess, if that kind of idea that that was really what I wanted was actually Brexit. All right. Ah. Now, this had nothing to do with the impact of Brexit on the property market. All right. It was entirely on my perspective of how I was looking at the world and Funnily enough, that was around the same time that I just started to get into trading, not into trading, but, you know, the guy in the office next door had said to me, I've started trading, you know, doing, doing FX, you know, it's a nice little side income. Would you be interested? You know, that kind of trading. Um, so not proper trading at all, just the kind of, you know, oh, it's easy to earn money from trading, that one. Um, so I kind of just I love how you say things. that one. <laughs> yeah, we all That's know that brilliant. story. We all know that story. I love it. <laughs> so uh, i think we all started there to be honest um you know in the retail oh, world, oh, oh i did I, I, yeah. i'll happily tell you some stories too but please continue <laughs> so so yeah the whole thing with brexit was that it was a shock to me because i i didn't expect for one second the, the, the result um and also because i saw the trading side of things there was this kind of there were a lot of people that made a lot of money betting on that and i looked at that and went well hang on a minute you know like why did what did they see mm -hmm. that I didn't was kind of part of that and also they made a lot of money from that that's attractive obviously you know maybe I could do the same thing all right and that kind of that is where the seed of it really really was sown I think um so and also the fact that, that my idea about Brexit that it must have been like a because I was very much the kind of remain and reform type you know type person I thought it made make any sense to, to leave or anything else but as the layers wow. sort of came came off, you know, I've, I've realized over time that there was a hell of a lot that I didn't understand. That I didn't realize about the EU and about the relationships. And, you know, well, I'm not going to get into it, but I've basically basically flipped the completely opposite way over the years now. So and I yeah, realized moments that the of time, ligometry, knowing what you, uh, quantifying what you know you didn't know. That's kind yes. of what happened. Yeah, that's a really good way of describing it. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, exactly how it works. Um, and but obviously it wasn't really a moment it was more a phase <laughs> I'd say you know it's kind of like there was a realization that hang on things are different to what I thought they were but then there was a phase of kind of like working through it all and kind of almost deconstructing it to try and figure out which bits were true and which weren't and, I, and I, I, you know like, like for example the whole racism thing you know it must it's only racist that voted for Brexit you know all of that sort of stuff and I kind of looked and I went well hang on a minute I've known him all my life he's not racist Mm -hmm. And I kind of started asking people then, which obviously to a lot of time, they didn't really advertise their reason for <clears> voting this stuff because it was so uh, kind of and controversial is not the right word, but it, it felt controversial. You know, like if it didn't matter which way you voted, it was like you didn't talk about it because, it, you know, people were sort of it was very passionate polarizing. about the whole thing. Very polarizing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was super polarizing. I mean, I remember when I moved to the UK back in 2018 and gosh, you know, people were in an absolute tizzy about what you know what was going to happen to the country and oh we're done for it's like i'm like whoa guys you're not done for not even close but anyway you know of course i mean from your from your course. perspective as well like coming from south africa you know you're like no guys you haven't got problems don't no, worry no, no. <laughs> I'll, show, I'll show you problems yeah, 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 exactly. But it just builds on to your point, mate, that, uh, you know, it, it is so polarizing. And, and you know, I, I mean, I would obviously like your thoughts on this if you experience the same thing. But I noticed that, uh, that the whole Brexit thing had a very binary aspect to it. Never mind the whole polarizing, it was also very binary. If you're smart, vote remain. If you're stupid, vote leave. There was nothing in between. And I just thought, wait a second, I know some pretty freaking smart people highly clued up, highly insightful, highly educated, who voted leave. Hmm, something's wrong with this picture. 
the hypothesis yep. can't be correct. Exactly. Exactly the same thing that I had. Exactly the same thing that I had. After the first day, the shock, the shock of it kind of was like, I spent that for that first day and like, oh my God, you know, because I hadn't considered it as a possibility even. I was so confident, you know, which again, there's a recurring thing there, you know, in trading. So um, with Trump, isn't it? it, it <laughs> well, this is this is the one you see. This is this yeah. is when when it really started to I really started to question things was when that happened as well. Because I distinctly remember, right, I'll tell a bit of I'll tell the little, little trading stories in this as well. Yeah, like yeah, my early days in trading, just so that everyone can have a laugh. Um, so I basically from the whole Brexit thing and everything else, I started to do a little bit more trading bit on, on after that as well. And kind of just, just exploring things in general. I think I kind of just opened myself up to more, more stuff. Um, so I was trading and, and on a weekend, now this is when I'd kind of got into it a bit more before, in the run up to the election, I think it was the weekend when Hillary Clinton email was got, uh, got leaked, but it was, yeah, it was about it was a definitely week or two something. Before. Uh, I think it was around about there, wasn't it? About a week yes. or two before the election date. Yeah. Gosh, that was it. Ago. Jeez. It is. It is. Yeah. 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 Six years. So, so at the time I had, uh, I had an account, I think it was forex.com if I'm not mistaken. And they, they let you put in orders on the weekend. Right. Which ah. I don't, I haven't had another broker that lets me do that since. Um, I don't know if it actually got, you know, like kind of like regulated or something so you wouldn't do it. So I believed, okay. I saw the news come out. I went, Oh, that's going to be bad for the dollar was my thinking. All right. Um, so I put this order in to sell the dollar. I think it's against the euro. Um, sold the dollar, and obviously on the open, what ended up happening was that it gapped down. I got filled at the first available price, which obviously was far far lower than the order I'd put in. It then did what markets tend to do when they gap Ouch. and rallied in reverse, stopped me out, and I had no clue what had happened. So I'm trying to contact these people at support, you know, support at the broker again. I don't understand yes. it. My price was this price. I put it in the system and you've given me a completely different price. What's what's happened here? And like the guy who was supposed to be my account manager was like, oh, you need to talk to support. Um, you know, you like, just farmed oh me off. Yeah, that's yeah, not yeah. a good so, sign when you hear that. Well, yeah, I mean, I kind of obviously now I know exactly what it was. <laughs> it was just like this fucking idiot. I haven't got time for him. So, because obviously, you know, you can't, I, they didn't run a weekend market or anything else. I wasn't yeah, even filled when market opened. But I was an amateur, it, I didn't yeah. have a clue what I was doing. No, but let's also face it, mate. I mean, in hindsight, you know, uh, look, similar things have happened to me before. But now we know that most of these guys haven't got a damn clue to begin with anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, please continue. This is fascinating stuff. So, so yeah, so then I had, I mean, at the time it was only small money that I was, I was using. So I had like a thousand, a uh, thousand euro account and on the election, what was for me, the election morning, which obviously was just at the time when, when Trump was sort of, you know, when, when it was becoming apparent that Trump, Trump was probably going to win. Mm -hmm. All right. Now I, what had I done again? I think I, I, I was like, Trump's bad for the dollar. Trump's bad. Full stop. That was the, that was the, again, the mentality I had at the time. Still hadn't kind of got beyond that uh, kind of good and bad way of looking at the world, that, bi that binary way. Yeah, yeah. So Trump was bad. That meant it was bad for the dollar. And to be honest, I, I mean, I, I well over leveraged and I, I, I did well shorting the dollar at that time initially when it looked like Trump was going to uh, was going to win. Or at least that, that was my perception at the time. I, again, I had no clue what was actually happening. This is just my perception. Um, so I actually managed to make a bit of money there. Right. But then when it was announced that he was the winner, right, I thought the people, you know, people don't realize this is terrible for the country. So I kept shorting the dollar. Oh. Obviously, the market was the market was well ahead of me on that. And, you know, actually, it might not be so bad for the country. And obviously, now we know who's won. So we can crack on. We get looking at the future again. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was I was so convinced that the market was wrong and I was right with all of my non-political knowledge not even understanding how elections really worked or anything like that um but yeah that was a lesson that was a real lesson and i'll be honest the, the lesson that i really took from it at the time as well on the day i i think i, I took I, I basically added about 50 percent to my account and i ended up taking it back down to about 400 i think it was before i kind of went this is stupid but all of this was happening in like rapid fire you know this is in like 10 minutes a ridiculously fast period of time Oh yeah. So, so all of that was going on. And my takeaway from that was like, after about 10 minutes where I went, Oh my God, I made a load of money. Then I lost a load more money. 
because obviously in my head as well, the sunk cost bias or the, the house money effect, even, uh-huh. you know, I, I'd kind of, I hadn't actually lost, uh, you know, a thousand. I'd, I'd only lost from like my initial thousand down to 400. I only lost 600. That was the way that I was quantifying it. Um, and also I was like, well, if I can lose money this fast, imagine how quickly I could make it if I was right. Oh gosh. Yeah. I've made that mistake too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh how so so yeah and i just kind of it all, it all kind of spiraled from there that was sort of that was when i first started getting into it and again it was just a <clears> constant <throat> process of trial and error and discovery you know like like what what are these things that i thought are true that i no longer think are true or that i you know that i no longer trust are true perhaps is a better way of, uh, of looking at it and then i went and explored them and then i figured out whether i still thought they were true and yeah, that's that sort of is, is where it all happened. And then started getting more into markets because of that. Um, and then was it, I'm trying to think when it was that I started with David. I'm trying to think now, I think it was 2000 and at some point in 2019 when I joined Macrodisiac as a member, as a sub. And again, at that time, yeah, I had no real That's he founded clue. it. Uh, I didn't yes. recall that he founded it early in 2019. Yeah, that was it. And I was one of the early, the early members. Um, and yeah, I just loved it. I absolutely loved it because I was, David in a lot of ways taught me, taught me how to think about some of these things as well. You know, he, he really, he really helped with, with that side of how, you know, how to think about things rather than just have a lot of people who are just like, here's this thing, this is how it works. Now shut up and leave me alone. You know, he, he wasn't like that. He was much mm. more kind of, you know, this is how to think about these things. This might be true. This might be more true than that, but you know, really, the, the, the non-binary kind of way of looking at the world, I think, is one of the one of the first things that I learned from it. And also the confidence to just have a view and not be worried if it's wrong. Yeah. That as well was another yeah, big, it's not big a sort statement. of eureka. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's a view, not a statement. I always say that there's a massive difference between the two. You know, they might seem very similar, but they're actually very different. Statement is with utter confidence that you are 100% correct of view is the way you're looking at something, but you're open to being wrong and changing your mind about it if new information is presented to you. Yes, that's a very good way of framing it. Yeah, like that, like that. And, and, and you know, that's actually one of the, one of the things that I also learned. Uh, trading taught me this, but I read this somewhere that the, the, and I'm paraphrasing here, the, the truest sign of intelligence is to ask yourself this question, can I entertain a new idea? I think in trading, you have to do that all the bloody time because your, yeah. your, your, uh, your ideas are constantly being forced to adapt to the changes in the world because nothing remains overly true for overly long. Look at how many headlines we see nowadays. You know, Okay, let's use the Ukraine war, for example. Peace talks are underway. Things are going great. 20 minutes mm. later, no, they're not. Oh, shit. You know, it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that's what I think trading forces you to do. You have to be able to adapt. There is a very Darwinian aspect to it. Adapt or die. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And I think with um, the other thing is as well, you kind of, you also learn that there's two ways of, of kind of, of looking at new information as it comes in as well when you're looking at markets. is One is how people will react to it. And the other thing is what it actually means, you know, for the, uh, for the bigger picture. And we've talked a lot, you know, like privately, we've talked a lot of the time yeah. about the systems, system one versus system two sort of oh, thinking, yeah. you know, the Kahneman, um, Kahneman, Tversky, and, and, and those ideas of, of the fast and thinking fast versus thinking slow. Oh, yeah, the biases. I definitely think, yeah, yeah, but even just the thinking fast, thinking slow, without you getting into any, any of the biases, mm. it's just that there's in the market when you're watching these things happen, there's often a kind of immediate reaction, which doesn't necessarily make any sense in the bigger picture. And if you're looking, if you're keeping an eye on the bigger picture, so what really matters, what are the things that if these things happen, you know, for example, in the Ukraine, Ukraine conflict, mm. you know, what are the things that could actually change this permanently, should we say, change the course of this, you know, and that's the sort of system to, you know, deeper level thinking. And then you've got system one where you're just kind of instantly reacting like, oh, this is good or this is bad, you know, and that, that I think is, is where you've got to differentiate it. And I think a lot of the time it's, it's really, it's a hard thing to do. And like you say, it's about having that view because you're not having a view on what you think will happen over time and what you think is important is also how people will react to those things, irrespective of what you think. Oh, totally. Um, 
that that's that's also to me one of the most humbling effects of trading is that uh, you know your view might I don't know if you've also noticed this that your view might be right in the moment but something can come out and completely obliterate the validity of your view in an instant and and that is sometimes very hard to deal with especially if you are very attached to your view yeah yeah definitely definitely the attachment is the problem the attachment mm. is the problem I think I think you've got to again you've got to separate out the the view from what is likely to happen so it's kind of the view of the like why am I making this decision and that's the kind of there's there's that that's all the view is really it's sort of like if I'm making a decision I'm making it because I'm looking at these factors now obviously you've got the unknowns that can come along and and screw it up for you entirely they can either change the direction entirely of what you were looking at and you've got to adapt and go with that or you've got the uh, the other sort of uh, the other side of the unknowns, which is something again, like I say, this kind of short term reaction, where something else can suddenly jump over the things that you're looking at and become like the primary focus temporarily, and that's good enough to take you out of the trade. But your view was probably still right, and it may be proven right later. You know, after that initial kind of that that thing that's jumped into view fades again, and you drop back down to the next you know, the previous levels of sort of, you know, what's going on and they become the primary focus again. So yeah, it's, it's a really hard thing. That's why you kind of, I think not, you've got to not have, you've got to kill your darlings as the, uh, as the saying goes, I can't remember who said that some, some right is a, a writing quote. You've got to kill your darlings. Like the things that you feel most preciously about when you're writing anything, I'm sure it, was, I like like, it might be like, yeah. I like that one. You've got to kill your darlings. Okay. I yep. don't know if you're going to write that one down. <laughs> yeah, that's it. I'll have to look up who actually said it as well. I'm terrible for this. I always remember loads of things like this, but I never remember who said them. Um, so, but yeah, that's um, you know, that that's sort of that's the way that I look at it is you you can have those views, but you've got to be ready to just literally just just kill them as soon as you know, as soon as anything comes out which negates them, basically. It doesn't necessarily mean that you just abandon them altogether, but you No, no, no. You know, you've got to be able to just sort of just ignore them and just say, right, that's that's in that box over there. I'm not going to pay any attention until this new thing is is becomes clearer. I think that's where noise comes into it. Remember our conversation that we were having about noise, you know, affecting yep. your bias, because we all have a bias in some way mm -hmm. or form. You know, it's I think it's impossible not to have a bias, um, e even in the slightest way, uh, way, shape or form. But the noise is often the thing that causes a lot of error within the biases themselves, as Kahneman also pointed out in his book. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree. I'd agree with that. I think they they definitely sort of they're, they're fuel for the biases. The noise can be fuel for the biases. Yeah, it? it's like that that example that you and I were talking about the of the underwriting uh, for insurance policies, and that the deviation between them was not only the expected ten percent, but actually fifty five percent. And that's, that's yes. at an underwriting level with actuaries, with incredibly smart people doing those calculations. So, that's right. So that was, a, that was a trial they did, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was what led him to actually uh, co-author the book with, with the other two guys. And I mean, yes. the, I guess the point that I'm trying to make there is if there's that much variability among really smart, skilled and educated, highly educated people, um, we can imagine how much variability there is between, or rather among people who don't necessarily have those same, that, that same set of skills, uh, ability or level of education for that matter. Yeah. Yeah. Massive differences, massive differences, which is, which is why, again, you've got a, uh, again, something that I've, I think everyone falls, falls into the, the trap of doing. And I know not, I definitely have is um is the kind of trying to read people's minds you know people mm. that you don't know it happens all the times with like politicians and things especially yeah, good luck. because there's a the, yeah exactly there's a bias they, they don't even know what they're thinking so you know how are you supposed to try and read their mind and figure it out and even if they do know what they're thinking they might change their mind two hours later because some advisor tells them it's the right thing to do to win votes but yeah it's when you're analyzing these things you can't try you can't sort of mind read too much you can kind of look at things and think okay so if i'm in their shoes then maybe you know they might think this or they might think that they might think you know and you can kind of work out a few possibilities and assign a probability to it but try and say that like oh this is boris johnson so he's all about this so that means that he'll do this like well no it doesn't mean that at all it's not an algo you know? yeah exactly exactly especially with someone like boris johnson oh you know? gosh yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, for he's, not, he's not exactly predictable. No, some people call him the UK's Trump, you know, because he has very similar attributes. He'll say one thing and then he'll do something completely the opposite of what, yes. what he said. I, I, like, um, I like Dominic Cummings' um, description of him where he calls he called him the trolley. Did you hear it? Did you hear that? No, no, I haven't heard that one. Yeah, <laughs> nicknamed him the trolley because he says he's basically like a runaway trolley in a supermarket that kind of, just sort of careers from one, one side of the aisle to the other and just bashes into everything. Yeah, wow. Uh, okay. Yeah, but but it also makes you wonder why people choose people such as, well, or rather people, you know, I'm, I'm speaking very generally over here, but what makes the voting cons constituency, is that the correct word, um, mm -hmm. vote for the Trumps, the, the Johnsons, you know, the Putins of the world? Um, I mean, Yes, there is a cultural component that comes into the mix. And obviously, you have your physical attractiveness, your mental attractiveness, the tonality of your voice. I mean, can you believe it? But um, Bill Clinton was said to have won the election back in 1992 or 93 because women found his voice more appealing than George Bush's. I mean, freaking hell, can you believe that a voice can actually make such a difference? But that aside, if you know that this is what, if you know that these are the attributes that a future leader would have, you know, it's, it, it does beg the question, why the hell do, do, do people keep voting for them and act all surprised? Oh, no, I never knew this about them. Uh, you kind of did. That's why you voted for them. But now you're all surprised by it. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? If you have any, of course. No, no, I've got, I've got plenty, plenty of thoughts on, on this, to be honest. It's, 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 again, fascinating because you looked at Trump and I, and I thought about it a lot as well at the time. Like, why mm. would anyone vote for Trump? You know, like, what, what the fuck is going on? Yeah. You know, like, what is this world where in these, in these years where, you know, everything's falling apart and, you know, in terms of like the European Union and Brexit, and then you've got Trump coming in and going, saying everything that he said and doing everything he did in that, you know, to win that election. And you're like, well, what the hell is this? And I... I think that there is, there's a lot of, there's a lot of levels of subtlety to it that I don't think you can just break it down to saying, oh, it was because of, for example, Bill Clinton's voice, or it was because of this policy or this thing. I think no, it's, it's actually, contributing it's, factors. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I know that, you know, in the media, they like to say that, oh, it was because of this thing or it's because of that thing. No. It keeps it simple. But, you know, like, like, for example, there was one thing that I saw that I liked the kind of the idea behind was that both for, for Trump and for, and for Johnson, they had a kind of, um, there was an active role to the slogan. Okay, so make America great again, get Brexit done. You know, mm. they're very much active. It's, it's all about doing things, making things better, being kind of almost part of something, you know, and it's like, it's a, it's a kind of togetherness there as well. Like, cause you know, people, I think by some point, the majority of people did want to get Brexit done by the time that Johnson was looking at the election as well, you know, because yeah. they were just fed up with it. Um, you know, to get Brexit done, it didn't necessarily mean what you might think immediately to everyone, you know, on like the subconscious level. It didn't just mean, oh, let's just get it done and get it over with. But that was how I think a lot of people would have interpreted it and gone, oh, you know what? You know, like, yeah, we need to get this done because if we don't get this done, we can't move on to the next thing. So it was an active kind of, right, we're moving forwards. Get out of limbo. essentially. Get out of limbo, you know, and the same with America, you know, Trump, Trump also, he, you know, that slogan wouldn't have worked at a time when America, when people felt like America was great. You know, I yeah. don't actually think that America's as bad as it's made out. There's plenty not, of problems, the same as there are everywhere, um, you know, but it, it, it resonated because people have felt that America is in decline and that things are getting worse, especially since the financial crisis. And, you know, and someone like Trump comes along a bit like Farage in the UK as well. They speak clearly about things. They simplify things in a lot of ways. And they speak to what people, they speak to how people feel, mm. you know, rather than how people actually think. And I think if you, if you bring them in at a time when perhaps, you know, how people feel has been too promoted and you try and get them to, to play on that, then I think perhaps you kind of, you, you, you get more resistance and that's not going to work, you know, because more of the kind of logical side has kicked in that like, now we don't need feelings right now. We don't need to feel these things. You know, we need to we need to be doing something that might be harder. You know, perhaps like like now, for example, there might be a lot of sacrifices to be made now, and that kind of message isn't the message that's going to get the population voting for you at a time when you're perhaps defending democracy as it might be pitched 
at the next elections or at the midterms that are, that are coming up in the US now. Which is a with lot everything of nonsense, going on. in my opinion, you know, defending democracy. It is, it's, you know, it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that. I agree. I, I agree. Know, no, yeah, people you, you, get you behind it. Like, yeah, people get behind this stuff. And that's, that's where I think it comes from. You know, it comes from that kind of that tribal element that we've all had from, from before and the kind of the, oh, yeah. the craving for progress and change and improvement and all of those things that we, that it seems to be hardwired into us, I think. Yeah, I think so. And, and also, um, patriotism is, is a very interesting topic to me. I mean, you, you probably would have noticed that Americans in particular, and, and you know, I, I don't think patriotism is a bad thing per se when I say this, but to me, patriotism isn't something that you should necessarily feel just because you are born somewhere. So I'm born in South Africa, so automatically I'm a South African patriot. To me, patriotism is something that should be earned the same way that respect and love are earned, if you see where I'm coming from with that. Your country kind of has to, the way your kind. What is a country after all? It's a collective of people's mentalities, wishes, hopes, and dreams, and all that stuff combined into a collective. You know, in, in, into into one unit, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. if you if you don't resonate with that, or if the the actions of the collective are not conducive with your values. Um, it's going to be very hard for you to feel patriotic. And yet patriotism is often used as a reason to take certain actions, go to war, vote for this candidate because he's got, he or she has got the best interest at heart and all that. But a lot of it is propaganda to me. How do you feel about that? Or if you even yeah. agree with my view? If, no, I ba basic, basically do. I basically do. I think it's, it's definitely, um, patriotism is a, is a weapon that politicians can wield very well. Um, just because, you know, it's a bit like supporting football teams and everything else, you know, mm. you've got a, you know, any kind of sports team. Um, and it kind of just unites people around behind something, but it works best at times of conflict. Yeah. I think um, that when it's left to just drift, and again, you probably, the UK is a great example of this. You know, when it's sort of left to drift, you've got a load of people that just love to criticise the UK. And, you know, most of them would never even dream of living anywhere else in the world, let alone actually, you know, really. They wouldn't travel. cope. <laughs> no, exactly. They wouldn't cope, you know, and they, they, they I don't know, they've been to an all-inclusive hotel once, so they, they've travelled to India, <laughs> you know, that. <laughs> like, yeah. And, and the, you know, but they have very, very strong opinions, you know, and, and the UK, obviously, it's, it's all going terribly wrong and blah, blah, blah. And, and it's like, well, I mean, people I... People do like to I, complain there. You're right. I did notice love it. that when they I lived love there. It. It's like a national yeah. sport. Yeah, there should have to be a club called, a football club called Complain. <laughs> <laughs> but people, people, wouldn't, people, wouldn't sponsor, people wouldn't sponsor that and they wouldn't go and watch it. No. So, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to do the branding, mate. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, no, no, it's definitely something there. And I, like, I've, I haven't have been back to the UK until very recently. I haven't been back for, uh, to where I grew up at least for, I don't know, six or seven years, something, maybe longer. I can't actually remember. It's been a long time. And I was actually surprised by how similar it was, even, even after the pandemic and everything else, when I went back a few weeks ago, how similar everything was and how little so much of it had actually changed. You know, a lot, we went and visited like old houses where, when we, you know, me and my mates grew up, we went and had a little drive around. And, was it like going back look, to the Shire? so to speak yeah a little a little bit a little bit and it's just like <laughs> it's just all the same you know there's really there are little things that have changed and you know like some of the retail units and things same as everywhere they've, they've really struggled um you know so there are more shops that are empty than there were when i grew up there when it was pretty much entirely um you know entirely full you barely had a you know a shop to let so yeah but th things don't really change that much but people like to pretend that they do i just, I just think it's just something to talk yeah. about and if you always like to complain, then that's that's what you're going to talk about. You're going to find things to talk about and say, this is going wrong, that's going wrong. And that's going to be your your interpretation and your perspective on, on the world, however right or wrong or, or justified it might be. I think, you, you know, you've touched on a very interesting point here, mate. And, and to me complaining and yes we are all guilty of it in some way or form so i'm not trying to say that i never complain uh, i just try to reduce the amount of complaining that i do quite dramatically but what i have noticed even within myself whenever i've complained about something 
it can actually give you an elevated sense of self-importance. Ooh, mm -hmm. you have to, you know, I feel aggrieved by something. So therefore you have to now listen to me feeling aggrieved. And I want you to either validate me or, uh, you know, otherwise I'm not going to be overly happy with you. And that's, uh, and that's uh, what, what happens rather often that I've noticed even within myself when I was less aware of my behavior, but also with other people, it's like, you're not allowed to freaking disagree with them on their, on their grievances, because otherwise, oh no, you, you, I, I don't want to talk to you anymore. I can't deal with this. And, and I yeah. think that's one of the problems we have in the world right now is people don't want to communicate and sit down and discuss their differences. Just because I disagree with you doesn't mean I'm against you. There's a big difference between the two. We've had disagreements between yeah. the two of us, but we don't get nasty about it because you can point something out to me and say, Adrian, you know, I think you're looking at this from the wrong point of view because of so-and-so and so. And I can sit and listen. Ah, oh, okay, I see where you're coming from. I never thought of that. But boy, there are many people who cannot do that and will not do that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very, very true. I think um, I think you're you're definitely right on the complaining thing. Is it's, it does give people that elevated sense of importance because it kind of it puts them it puts them in the spotlight, I guess. You know, and like you say, if you if you then disagree with them, then it's almost like booing someone off the stage. Yeah, you know, like saying, "No, nah, that was rubbish," and or, or you know, or you're wrong, basically, which is essentially how how it would be taken, whether it was meant that way or not. Um, so you're either not as important as you thought you were, or you're more misinformed than you thought you were, or any of those things. There's no positive outcome to that, other no. than the only thing you can do is agree. That's basically it. But if you think about what complaining actually, what it is, like what what are the necessary, what's the necessary kind of way of viewing things if you actually want to complain? Like it's it, there's only two things you complain about: that things aren't going the way you think they should, uh. or you're kind of yearning for things to return to how they used to be. That's really mm. the only two ways that you mm. can frame what someone is doing when they're complaining. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I, I never quite thought of it in both ways. I mean, like yearning for the way things used to be. Yes, the, that one definitely made sense. But I never gave any consideration to they're not the way you want them to be or thought they would be. So it's your yep. own thought construct. And, and, you know, bringing it back to markets, it's like we often see this on Fintwood. Oh, uh, bullshit markets or phony markets uh -huh. or yeah. uh, you manipulated know, manipulated manipulated market uh, it's always manipulated there's always bullshit involved there is always and when i say bullshit I'm, I'm not saying it's wrong or right by the way you know i'm just saying that you know bullshit can be a rumor it can be you know a, a news event or whatever that turns out to be uh, you know, not as newsworthy as it was. So you can argue that that's bullshit, but you can't complain about the way the game is played when you know what the rules are or the lack of yep. rules that exist. Or am I wrong? Mm -hmm. Totally, totally agree. Totally agree. It's And I think that's that's where the complaining stems from. It's like people think that this should happen. This should be the way things work. That's a and problem. then it doesn't work that way. So it's a problem. You know, and this goes for like everything. You know, people love to, be, they love to complain about like the rich people, for example. You know, oh, it's all right. Well, what we should do, we should just tax Jeff Bezos. He's always my favorite. Just tax him and then and then we'll fix everything. Basically, we'll take all his money. We'll give it to other people. Problem solved. Why don't they just like you talk? Yeah, why don't they just? Yeah, I love that. I love that phrase. I love that. You know, phrase. I actually use that a lot now. And you, you, <laughs> you, no, I actually do. And I, I've actually called people out on, on, on that before in conversation. It's, I would say, you know, this is what, love, what my friend Tim would say is, why don't you just do this kind of thinking and you know they're just stopping their tracks and like what do you mean and then i explain oh right i did do that yeah exactly you I, kind I, of like, I like how you blame me for this this is, this is well, well you know i got it from you and i like to give credit where credit's due <laughs> <laughs> yeah, credit credit me when you're not like telling people that their views are all wrong and my friend tim says that you're wrong because <laughs> <laughs> okay well i just want to say i don't like to plagiarize views let's put it that yes. way so so, so this fair. was so this was one of my one of my reasons but you know then i build on to it and then i then i would often say look i had this discussion it was actually pointed out to me whenever i did it you know why don't they just or why don't they just yeah. this why don't they just that because it seems so enlightening that you are this person who comes up with this shockingly simple solution to this incredibly complex problem wow how could you not have seen this people jeez 
Uh, yeah, that's that's it. I actually, I kind of, you know, I kind of credit that because, right? So, I, I, this is a really odd thing, okay? But I, I think that really getting into conspiracy theories about ten or so years ago, a bit longer than that, it was really in the aftermath of the whole crash, you know, the whole global mm, depression, mm. Uh, financial crisis thing. Um, I was kind of looking for answers back then as well. What they do. And, and yeah, and that was, and I kind of went down all of those rabbit holes. And it's amazing how many things there are that are hidden under the surface and everything else. But you kind of, after a while, you start to realize, you start to find the flaws in the kind of, in how it's all put together, you know, and then sort of like the logical leaps that you have to make to, to sort of have this conspiracy theory actually yeah. hold together. And like I, the moon I landing, of, like the moon landing is a prime example. It's easier yeah. to actually go to the moon. Yeah. you know and plant a yeah. flag than to keep yeah. a secret for how long has it been now 50 years sick almost Longer, yeah 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 over yeah. 50 years now so which one's harder to actually just go there and do it plant the freaking flag or keep this secret of a fake landing it just doesn't make sense no exactly and you think how many people would need to be involved in these kind of cover-ups and these oh. kind of plans and all this sort of stuff and you kind of too much effort. and again if you all you have to do is just work even in even in a small group of people that are supposedly of a similar shared interest, you know, just at work. And you think how difficult it actually is to get those people to agree on anything, let alone a course of action, yeah. and then hold that course of action over years without decades. anyone deviating from the plan, your decades, without anyone deviating from the plan. You know, the whole thing That's is pretty just... much impossible. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think this idea of kind of the conspiracy theory kind of as a as a kind of center out thing, you know, whereby there's this group of, of people at the center of it all that decide everything. And then, you know, then they impose their will on the world is just completely flawed. But there is definitely a kind of a whole sub level of kind of negotiations and uh -huh. kind of uh, convergences of interest, I like as a, as a phrase, like where their interests align, and certain things are agreed at different levels, but it's not between like the, the same group of people it's no. between interested individuals and interested entities companies whatever you want to say that that realize that there's an opportunity there and they're better at recognizing that than the rest of us totally basically. my friend totally agree with you and, and you know what my late dad um pointed out something very interesting to me uh you know many years ago he said that he had met these two uh derivatives traders from uh well they were south africans but they lived in dubai via one of his friends and, uh, you know, they got talking about, you know, Illuminati. I, I don't believe in that mm -hmm. nonsense, personally. Um, if, if you delve into the history, anyone with even half a brain will realize that Illuminati, if you look at the word, it means the illuminated or the enlightened ones. They were a group yes. of scientists who tried to get together to, uh, you know, share ideas, you know, on the uh -huh. development of the, of the universe and solve the mysteries of the universe, not some kind of takeover plot. And somehow that evolved into what we know to be because anything secret is evil. Have you noticed that? No, secret. I have, I have noticed that. Yeah. Secret, yeah, yeah, yeah. ooh, must be evil. No, it's yeah. not necessarily evil. You keep a lot of secrets about what happens in your home. It doesn't make you evil. You know, so I mean, yes, it's, 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 very the same, true. it's the same kind of thing. Uh, but he said one of the guys gave him a very interesting perspective on the Illuminati. And I would actually like to hear your, your um, thoughts on this take. He said that. The Illuminati is not a group of people. It is a level of wealth that you attain. And, uh, and then based on the resources that you control, you inadvertently become a member of the Illuminati. He, he didn't say exactly how much, but he said, for example, if you become worth, for argument's sake, $10 million, you are literally, and let's not compare ourselves to billionaires over here, but you're, of the richest pe you're among the richest people in the world if you have a net mm -hmm. worth of more than $10 million. So the resources yeah. that you control and the things that you can do give you a lot of power in, and influence in any mm -hmm. case. So he mm -hmm. said, that is what puts you in the Illuminati. It doesn't mean that you have, it has to be a group of people sitting around a table and negotiating the fate of the world. It literally is just the amount of resources and power that you control, given your level of wealth that you attain. And yeah, I thought- that makes. That's a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I've actually got another little theory extending on from that as well. Okay, so tell me, tell me if you think this is mad or not. Yeah, go All right. So, you know how how it is often the case that rich and powerful people are involved in in kind of 
child sex scandals, you know, paedophilia. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Or what, you know, all of these kind of things, like, like Epstein, like Epstein and everything else. Yeah. Now, because I sometimes just have these moments where I just think about things too much, I okay. started wondering, <laughs> started wondering why, why that would be. So you've got kind of one theory, which is the idea that that's just part and parcel of being rich. If you're in these kind of Illuminati conspiracy theory clubs and whatever, mm-hmm. that's just what you will do. And then I thought about it, I thought, well, that doesn't really make much sense because like it would almost be a prerequisite. They'd have to know beforehand. What that your all of them would were. do it. <laughs> yes, before they could kind of get into it. So that didn't make any sense. And then I kind of thought about it and thought, no, I know what it is. It's, it's boredom. If you're rich enough and powerful enough that you've got, you can do whatever the fuck you want, then you go after the things that people say you're not allowed to have. Yeah, it's a, it's a dopamine, uh, it's a dopamine resistance that I would, you know, like how people get insulin resistant yes. when they eat too yes. much sugar and all that. I think it's a dopamine resistant, resistance. Yep. Sorry, for lack yes. Of- yep. I, yeah, I think that's yeah, bang on, bang on. Yeah, that's sort of from a minute, yeah, physical level, definitely. They just, they just need, they need to kind of have those things and i think it's why you get these rich and powerful people sometimes that just take these insane risks as well it's because they can't get the dopamine elsewhere you don't you know, get your kicks. looking at them yeah yeah you, you don't, don't get your kicks that's you it. don't get your that's kicks it. on route 66 anymore you know so you you, you <laughs> get your kicks from somewhere else and it's actually a massive problem um yeah and and, and that i've actually seen this i know people who are very very wealthy i I mean, you know, there are so many different levels of wealth in any case. I don't think that you need to be a billionaire to be to be wealthy in any case. That, that's such a lot of hogwash that we've also been mm-hmm. fed by many of these Instagram models and people in the media mm-hmm. and all that. Because you, you are so fucking wealthy. Even if you just have $1 billion, you are ridiculously fucking wealthy. If you, can, yeah. if you consider that you are one of less than 4,000 people on the planet, officially speaking at least, Mm-hmm. Uh, versus the population of 8 billion. I mean, fuck, come on. Yeah. Do the yeah. math. I mean, that's 0.000005 of the world population or something like that. You know, maybe not enough zeros. But if you, you're right. If you just get to a certain level where you have, you've bought all the yachts, you bought all the cars, you know, the planes, mm-hmm. the, the yeah. trains, the whatever the fuck it is, the, the watches, the pens, what else is there to drive you? You know, because people, yeah. Dan Bilzerian put this brilliantly, and I don't think he's a brilliant guy by any means, but he, but I always give credit where credit's due. He said that people often confuse pleasure for happiness, and the two are mm. not one and the same. And I thought, damn, you know, for a guy who's meant to be a horn dog of notes, and, you know, just messing around with women, you actually are bang on the money here, mate. I can't yeah, fault well, he, I guess he should know. He should know, I would guess. Yeah, but, but that's what he said. He said he was chasing pleasure to such an extent that it nearly killed him, but yeah. he was not becoming any happier than what he was before. And I was thought, okay, wow. You know, th- that just shows you. It's easy to misconstrue the two. Yeah, entirely, entirely. Yeah, they're, and they're completely different things. Completely different things. I mean, I mean, happiness... Happiness has always been a funny, a funny thing for me as well, because it's sort of, yeah. again, you know, it's, it's talking about it in this, in this kind of way. If you've got, if you can do whatever you want and you can have whatever you want to have and all of that, and you've got that level of wealth, then why wouldn't you be happy? You know, that's the thing. And it's always because it's always relative. Yeah. You know, happiness isn't, it's not a permanent thing. It's relative to, you know, to where things are like if you if you go to I don't know you go to some deprived area of you know the sort of the the least developed parts of Africa for example yeah. and you give a child a toy just the most basic toy oh gosh, I've you know, seen then that. then you can make yeah you can make their you know you can make their week their month their year you know but you give that same toy to someone over here and it's like oh, I've got like ten of these probably smack <laughs> it away in your face and say yeah. well, well, give me the shit yeah I want a Nintendo Switch just roll with you yeah <laughs> it's and it's, it's so it's all relative you know it's the happiness is all relative and i kind of uh, there's definitely been uh, i think over this past for me at least over this past year is really something that i've actually started to figure out is that happiness is something oh, totally you, mate. you you control yourself to a large degree you know happiness is almost it's almost self-awarded in a, in a lot of ways you know and, and, it, and you can't maintain it indefinitely it's impossible but you just have to no, recognize no, when no. you're being you're when you're being unnecessarily unhappy and then you can kind of, yeah, I was being a bit of a dick, actually. <laughs> and you instantly feel happier. Yeah, totally. I mean, we, we can even revert this back to trading. It's like, remember when you first started out and you made, say, $100 on a trade? Wow, that yep. felt good, didn't it? It's like, yeah. damn, oh, yeah. you know, this is good yeah. money. 
the yep. value of a hundred dollars hasn't changed. You know, I mean, no, forget, about hands, infl- yeah. forget about inflation. <laughs> you know? uh, okay, Mister Technical, yeah. I love that. <laughs> 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 but a hundred dollars is still a hundred dollars inflation yeah. aside you know yeah. it's it's the way you perceive a hundred dollars that that has changed more yeah. than the actual value of well, 100 pounds for example whichever currency mm-hmm. you want to use yes but suddenly after if you but that's a problem and this is what a guy called sean aker who um who spoke at at uh, one of these TED Talks, and he called it the happiness advantage. He said one of the problems with society, and I think this is something we can take to heart as traders, as business people, as whatever it is in life that you want to do, is that he said one of the problems why people don't stay happy for long is because the goalposts keep on shifting. If I get a good job, I need to get a better job. If I get good grades, I need to get better grades. If I make $100 on a trade, no not good enough anymore. I need to make a thousand dollars on a trade now. And Mm -hmm. life just doesn't work that way. You know, life is not a linear growth process. It's more of a winding kind of process. You move up and then you move down a bit like stock markets. Where where does the stock market move up and down? Oh, sorry. Where where does the stock market just move up in a linear, in a linear process? It doesn't, you know, when that happens, what do we call that? bubble yeah sports, exactly exactly you know? blow off top only ways down yeah exactly yeah now isn't that the same thing for people yeah definitely definitely and i think you have to you've got to be um aware of that and I, I do think that that is something i think you know again i mean i've only been at this now i say only you know like the whole thing since like the middle of 2016 and the way that my my mentality towards all of this to well, but to adversity, I suppose, if you wanted to generalize it, you know, but through trading and through the markets, my attitude to adversity has completely changed. Oh, because yeah. I kind of, I just see it as, as necessary now. It's just part of it. You know, it's like, it's just, you just kind of get on with stuff and you try your best and you know that it's not always going to work, but you don't let that get you down too much. You know, you just kind of got to get up, dust yourself down and go again. And and I do, yeah, I kind of, <laughs> like trading, trading kind of in that sense, I, I, I've actually got written a note somewhere like in my real kind of like background kind of, I, I kind of write notes sometimes when I just have these stupid ideas that sometimes I might come back to. And I've actually like written down a, a title for my potential kind of book that I want to pass down to my children, which will be How Trading Saved My Life. Mm, save that's mine. Like how, yeah, that's sort of, and it's not the trading obviously, but it is the trading, but the trading is almost like the national service the that, you know, that everyone used to have before where you'd learn about these things, learn about difficulty and divert, you know, and, and yeah, and just trying to figure stuff out and not getting, not letting yourself get down, you know, like this too shall pass as the saying is, you know, and it does, you know, it feels it's like the, the end of the world one day, yeah. but the next day you wake up, you go again. It's, it's interesting. You mentioned this too shall pass. Do you know the origin of that saying? Uh, I, you know, I, I, Vaguely think it might have been like Winston Churchill or something, but it sounds wrong. Apparently, it comes from China, you know. And look, I'm sure oh, really? that they, uh, uh, and yeah, and I'm sure that there might be uh, a variety of other origin stories. But this is one that I heard, you know. So just bear with me for the sake of 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 the story over here. Apparently, there was a, 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 an emperor of China who who um, commissioned the the task to all the people in, in the land to come up with a say of saying or a phrase that would be true under all circumstances and then this wise man one day came and said uh, you know i i've come up with a saying and uh, you know this too shall pass you know and and then he was like what do you mean he said no matter how good or ma- no matter how bad something gets or anything in between this too shall pass and it shall change into something else and I was like, ah, yeah, that, 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 Pro- that, that, profound. Is, that, that is very profound. And I, and I seem to recall, and, and I could be wrong, but I think the reward for this particular guy also aligns with that story of the, uh, of the grain of rice on the chessboard. Are you familiar with that one? No, no, go on. Okay, so th- I think this was the challenge that, that, you know, he would be, that this guy who came up with the, this particular um, saying would be given any reward that he want, whether it was gold or land or whatever. And he said, I want a grain of rice to be placed on a chessboard and, du- and double the amount on the next block and so on and so forth. To illustrate 
and, and the emperor actually agreed to it. He was like, oh, well, fuck, fine, no problem, I'll do it. It turns out that the emperor didn't have enough rice in China to be able to fulfill that request because of the, the exponential effect of, of the increases in, on the chessboard. That's what no one could, that's what no one could account for. And it, I think that that's actually pretty damn amazing because it, it also, it also illustrates the complexity of life, you know, how many things you might think you have accounted for, you know, like, let's say you look at a chart, you know, you and I were looking at an iceberg detector the other day, a stock tracker, we were looking at price levels and volume profiles and news feeds and mm -hmm. moving averages and economic figures, whatever, and yet we can still get it wrong. Yet we still cannot predict what will happen one minute into the future, despite knowing yeah. all of those things that we have accounted yep. for. It's like a game of chess, for example. You know, th this figure astounds many people when I, when I tell them this, but you know that there are more potential chess games than what there are known atoms in the observable universe. I did not know that. That's, that just sounds wrong. <laughs> It well, sounds it wrong, sounds doesn't it? It so sounds wrong. wrong, doesn't it? But yeah. apparently there are an estimated number of chess games uh, totaling to roughly 10 to the power of 123, I believe, 124. That's a staggering amount, if you think about yeah. it. Yeah. And so, an astrophysicist estimate that, you know, based on the size of the universe and what we, what we know, this is just an estimate. They, they estimate that there are roughly... 10 to the power of 86 atoms in the observable universe, which is crazy to think that there are more potential chess games than, 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 that, than what there are atoms in, in the freaking observable universe. But I think the point that I'm trying to make is not, not try and, you know, have an understanding of what that number actually means, because frankly, I don't. I don't have the mathematical mind to, to fully grasp that number. But it also just shows me how complex life is, mate. You know, there, there are just so many variables that come into play. And as Gandalf said to Frodo in The Lord of the Rings, even the very wise cannot see all ends. Yes. Yeah, very true. Very true. I like that. Yeah. I actually, um, I actually really, I really like the, um, I really like story as a way to understand how people think about markets. Mm, it's something I'm starting, I've been starting to study more and more about the whole, you know, the whole mythology, the whole structure of stories, um, reading a bit of um, Joseph Campbell, have you seen his, uh, he's in his work? The, the I, have not yet. I have not yet, but I, but I did bookmark it, you know, I, I've, I, I've, I still need to get I, to it. I tell you what, actually, if you want a little, a little lowdown of that, that the one, the thing that got me onto it was Guy Ritchie on the Joe Rogan podcast a few oh, years gosh, ago. Yeah, yeah, with that one with the prodigal son. Yes, that's it. That's it. And he explained the whole thing. And that's yeah. like, and you look at that and you look, think about how many films and, and film sequences and all of those things are actually just that story rehashed in a different way. Yeah. It's literally, you know, where someone starts and there's um, Kurt Vonnegut as well. The shapes of stories. I love, I love that. I don't know. Have you seen, have you seen those that like, there's, a, there's predictable shapes to stories that they follow, like the plot lines? Apparently there are seven or six or seven uh, plot yep. lines that all stories follow. Have I got that correct? Something That's like that. That's basically it. That's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. And the majority fall into, it's a similar kind of thing, the, the kind of the hero's journey and, 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 you know, a similar structure to that. And what's the one thing that pretty much all great stories have to um, help them stand the test of time? adversity and then the happy ending a great villain oh yeah they've got to have that absolutely yeah. what, what else are you going to overcome yeah a great villain hence the adversity as you mentioned you know yes. it's like you you look at books no no religion no no religious context over here i'm just looking at the content of the book the bible has got mm -hmm. a great villain uh, lord of the rings harry potter um even you know the dan brown books because they're also very uh, they're, yes. they're very um popular books uh, mm -hmm. you know in the venture code uh, angels and demons and so on and so forth and then there was another book series that that, that was also very popular um it, it'll come to me but those are the ones that i can think of all of them have a great villain and as mm -hmm. you said you know it's not necessarily a happy ending but overcoming the adversity yes yeah, overcoming the adversity is always the sort of the happy ending, you know, and it's the kind of the transformation of the character as well. Like Harry Potter's brilliant for that, actually. Harry, but you know, the way that he kind of grows up and grows into the character 
as well, but always along the way by sort of breaking the rules a little bit as well, which I've always kind of liked that it's not, the goodies are never entirely good. No, no. But that's why I don't consider myself to be a good person per se. I consider myself to be an anti-hero if I had to fall into any category. An anti-hero? Why, you, why would you say that? Have you heard of an anti-hero? I've heard, I've heard the word, but I've never thought about what, what it really means. Ah, so an anti-hero. Um, okay, let's you, I mean, well, okay, first of all, before I start, how familiar are you with the Marvel comic universe, for example? Um, do, do you know the many of the uh, the uh, characters before I list a few? Yeah, right? I'd, I'd say I know the main the main ones. Okay, so, so okay, let's use an example. A hero would be someone like Captain America, mm-hmm. and obviously a villain would be someone like a Thanos. You know, to mm-hmm. to a, a reference Endgame. An anti-hero would be hmm, Deadpool or Wolverine. Uh-huh. So okay. they are neither aligned with the good side or the bad side they 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 aren't baddies but they're not but they're not afraid to cross the line when they need to Mm -hmm. you know so they will so they will tap into their dark sides when the time comes to use it whereas the hero is limited by his virtue he has to stick to the to the rules according to the book and that that is also that they're they're downfall at times because you can even see in the comic books it's like instead of eradicating the villain and the problem at hand no we, we've got to do the right thing and be virtuous and i think yeah. in trading very often i'm not saying do illegal things that's not even remotely what i'm advocating but sometimes i think you have to be a bit of an anti-hero when it comes to to become to be more successful in trading you have to uh should I say, push your own boundaries and tap into that dark side, you know, of, of yourself yes. to, to be willing to, to take the trades that no one else is willing to take, uh, you know, for example, to have the, to have the controversial view um, that other people might not agree with, even though you'll get chastised or laughed at or whatever. So, so that's why I say I'm an anti-hero. I'm willing to tap into the dark side, even if it makes me a little less popular for the time being. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And also it takes away from the, uh, you see, because uh, something that I've really struggled with like okay, along these lines over over time is that when I so when I first started with the trading thing, I actually did um, did a course with Tom Dante. Right now, uh, yeah, yeah, he's he, really good. He, he was, yeah, he's very very good. You know, I learned loads and loads from him. But his trading to me, okay, is quite. It's he's it's, an anti-hero, Tom. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But his trading, his trading kind of isn't or or. It didn't seem that way to me at the time. Okay, so when he shared his whole, his whole sort of strategy and how he does things and, and everything else with us, and it all just to me, it seemed far too structured and too rigid, right, in the way that he mm. trades because he has he has sort of certain rules, you know, and like if he's going to trade this setup, then it needs to look like this and yeah, yeah. all of these sort of all these sort of things. And at the time, I was just like, Jesus Christ, I'm not going to do all that. You know, like that that's just not me at all. Mm. You know. So I never did, okay? But obviously what I've discovered over time is that actually it's more about, you know, the reason why he has those rules is because he's made all of the mistakes that I'm making, all right? Or maybe not all of them, but certainly a lot a lot of them or variations of the same ones, as probably everyone, everyone does. Ah. And obviously, so he's built these rules as ways to kind of almost cage himself in to stop himself from making really bad mistakes is the way that I've kind of learned to interpret it. Like the rules and, and that, standards thing we were talking about the other day. Yes. Yes. That's it. That's it. Now, obviously I'm sure that if there, if there's certain conditions, exceptional conditions arise, then he will break the rules for those. Okay. And he will do something different, yeah. but generally he does those things because that keeps him in the game. You know, it's not about taking every trade. It's not about, you know, like predicting the future and saying, oh, it's going to go this way. It's going to go that way. No, it's about trying to make money. And when you're trying to make money, you have to be humble about your your limitations and what you can actually pay attention to totally. um, and reasonably, reasonably expect of yourself. You have and to I think independently learned, and be humble. You have to be. Yeah, entirely. But you've got to, you've always got to look at yourself as well and just say, right, you are at times like this, you're fucking useless. So don't put yourself in that situation because like that, today, that's... I'll 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 say it openly on this forum. Today, I am not easily going to trade unless something, as you said, incredibly obvious, incredibly exceptional, lights up for me. I don't trade on OPEX. I get busted yeah. up on OPEX. Yes. It's not my game. You know, yeah. simple. 
yep, that's exactly that, exactly that. So that's something that I kind of learned that at the time I was like, I was also that there was this idea that that's not me as well, that I'm not that kind of person, which actually I've kind of learned is a really limiting belief because I'm is perfectly true, capable of doing, yeah. of doing all kinds of things if I can, again, if I can tell myself the right story about why I'm doing them. But is it in alignment with your strengths or, or is it a weakness that you're trying to uh, cultivate? Because that is also an interesting uh, way of looking at it. And I learned this from my friend Byron Morrison, who is... Uh, He's a, a, a published author now, and he's also a pretty well-known um, performance coach, not, not motivational speaker, totally different thing, by the way, but he, mm -hmm. he's an okay. actual performance coach for CEOs. And he also said to me that um, the whole idea of turning your weaknesses into strengths is actually a load of nonsense. Because No, absolutely. Yeah, yeah because, because they, they, they're going to remain your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. you, everyone has weaknesses and he said so many of these self-help gurus sell you the nonsense of you know just tell yourself you're confident every day or uh, <laughs> you know just turn your weaknesses into strengths and he said since when does it work that way you know just because you just because so let's say for example you're built like a long distance athlete or you're built like a weightlifter doesn't mean you're suddenly going to become a world class of the opposite of, of your no. genetics you know, you have to work with what you've got, isn't that's, it? That's it. That's it. Yeah. And that's where you've got to be brutally honest about your weaknesses. Because that's that's the way that I actually look at progress now in trading is that I, I suppose if you put it in mathematical terms, you're trying to sort of cut off the left tail and allow the right tail to yeah. grow. So the, the left yeah. tail is where all the weaknesses and the negative things happen. And you're trying to stop the, the negative side from compounding, which is, I've done plenty of times, you know, adding to losers. There's been a real issue yeah. over, <laughs> over the too. years. <laughs> you know, I, just I still do it at times. Definitely going up. Yeah, I, I'm, really, I'm really trying to be strict on that now and saying like, I just, I won't do it. You know, I will not do it. That's I'd rather uh, not that, trade. To me, yeah, I'd rather not trade. I'd rather just take the loss and, you know, there'll be another opportunity. Mm -hmm. there'll be another opportunity you know and I, I, i'll never say that i've entirely conquered that you know I mean, and there always that, is, that's isn't the there? way that i'm looking at it that's the way that i'm trying to do it yeah there always is there's an abundance of opportunity. Yeah. the problem in the market isn't that there's not enough opportunities there's too many ah now we're touching on something interesting it's the it, it's that that um it's that bias well, what what do you what do you call it um i think we spoke of this before when you have too many choices is is it um decision, decision fatigue, fatigue. If, decision fatigue thank you that's the one i'm looking for markets can actually give you massive decision fatigue can't they yeah yeah so you've got to try and take fewer decisions so you've got to sort of although you can't impose your your will on the market you can set the conditions by which you're you're going to engage with the market almost, almost, almost a bit like a job you know if you set up a firm yeah. you know and you, you say right this is my business i'm a consultancy firm i don't know and i'll do this is my speciality i don't know a law consultancy or i don't know something something like that you're not going to then go off and start consulting people about drilling you know what why would you do that that's not your specialty that's not you have to define your boundaries you might know a bit about drilling but there's only so many hours you've got in the day so you've got to focus on one thing or another you know, and I think that that is where where you have to kind of look at it with with markets is you've got to start with much more um, focus on fewer things. Although we're always looking at lots of things that are coming in, like you've got to define right what are the things that matter or what are the things that I'm going to make decisions based on. Those oh. those sort of things so you have to kind of compartmentalize all of that, I think, and then and then that's how you end up making better decisions and sort of by being more focused, you know, narrowing Probably. that focus down. Totally, totally agree with you, mate. I mean, you know, you're, you're touching on something very interesting that I also wanted to um, have, a, have a chat with you about is the aspect of health and fitness, uh, you know, mm. be, being a trader. I think it's often one of the most underrated aspects of being, a, of being a, a, I don't want to use the word successful, you know, sometimes that feels incredibly pretentious um, mm. to, to use the words. But okay, for the sake of the conversation, use the word successful trader, you know, someone who has staying power, someone who can stay in the game, you know, someone who, who uh, you know, doesn't get flustered too easily or too quickly. I think mental and physical fitness play a heck of a big role in this. Yes, yeah, definitely. I think the physical side of it is definitely something there because it's something that actually you mentioned to me the other day that just rang, rang true with cortisol. The, um, with the cortisol. Yeah, mm. that's it. Something that I've noticed so often is that if I'm not exercising, I do, I can get more stressed and uh, kind of retreat more into my own head and, and everything else in, in a bad way. 
you know, sometimes it's good to go into my own head because I, I like, to, you know, to figure stuff out. But yeah, sometimes it's just like just withdrawing because I think it's I think it's probably a, a like a like a neuro a neural response almost like it's an overload of stress. So you kind of you, you tend to shut down. Yeah, um, because your immune system you also becomes weaker. That's probably yeah. why. Yeah, so it's like a protection thing. Like your body, you know, is just trying to trying to protect you from an overload of stress, and things start <laughs> shutting down because you can't take yeah. it anymore. And if you if you have if you use exercise to kind of expel that and get it out of you then you kind of you, you build up your your cortisol tolerance again you know you kind of you yeah, empty it and let it can refill through other things you know <laughs> yeah and then you can kind of get rid of it again speaking of uh, of uh, testosterone and cortisol you know I, I have a funny line that, that i want to use from a movie that i watched many years ago called road trip i don't know if you recall it by any chance or if you've like, seen it I, it's is this is road trip is this the the comedy Yes, it's a comedy, you know. Yeah, the mate, guy, I, the love guys who went to the I love lesson. that film. I love that film. Yeah, okay. I love now, that do you remember? Film. Do you remember the scene where, uh, where the where the smart guy cannot remember his name? You know, the one with the dark hair. He was sitting yeah. there smoking weed, and the old man came up to him and he said, "Are you going to pass over that doobie or what?" So the old man yeah. takes this big drag and he blows it onto the dog, and this and and this young guy said to him, "You know what?" weed is the only thing that balances me out by the time that i was in third grade i was worried about the war in iraq uh, to the point that that put me on xanax and all that and the old man looked at him and he said what you know what your problem is you're all brains not enough cock and balls (laughs) (laughs) yeah Yeah, and that's what i remind myself of too whenever i retreat into my head i just go remember adrian now you're all brains be more cock and balls more cock yeah. and balls. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what you what you think of that, but that's what I do, you know, to to uh, get, get get me out of my own head. Yes, yeah, I do. I do all kinds of weird things like that that just generally involve moving. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't have to be exercise. You know, sometimes I might even just turn the music up and just go go for a walk. You know, just even sing badly at a high volume if no one else is around. You know, you know what whatever. Recommend. It's just a release. It's just a release. You, you, you know what I also found really works for me, and I'm not saying everyone has to do this, but I have a pair. I have two pairs of these grippers. And you know those things that you that you squeaky things. You know that, these things that that I that that I that that you use to strengthen I, your hands. I know what you mean they're like like giant pegs. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so I bought some really good ones, and they've lasted me for yonks now. And let me tell you though. If you just sit and squeeze them a few times, uh, you know, in between breaks or whatever it is that you're doing, or if you're feeling a bit stressed, my goodness, does it help a lot. So not only do you, do I find that it reduces my stress levels, but you're also getting actual exercise. You're stimulating your nervous system. And, and I think that's one of the downsides of trading. If you sit down too long, you might get a lot of mental stimulation, but you don't get as much nervous system stimulation as you think you would. It's, that's true i mean yeah that is true unless you're shouting at the screens that too or don't punch <laughs> them don't punch them i made the mistake of doing that once Ooh, did i regret it or what no. yeah i'll bet <laughs> yeah that was that wasn't exactly fun but uh yeah i think this game I, I think you know to to draw to more of a conclusion i think one of the things that i've learned about this game is that it can literally bring out both the best and the worst of you yes very very yeah, 100%. easy hundred percent so it's it's everything it's everything you are there's there's a a guy that i actually that i've funny enough i've never i've never met him either um but a guy that i did tom dante's course with a guy called nick and his father-in-law had i don't know exactly what it was i think it was some i think he used to manage manage funds for a pension fund or something like that but he's he's retired now big boy he he told him at the beginning you know when he first started out he said you'll you'll learn far more about yourself than you will about the market and I've always mm-hmm. always remembered that quote, you know, that, he, that it, it 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 was so so genuinely true. In it, it certainly feels more true. I mean, that's probably in terms of volume of information and stuff that you actually learn is probably nowhere near true. But the kind of the sentiment of it is that you, the market kind of it, it has a way of revealing your your every your real self, I guess, if that's if that's a thing. I mean, I don't even necessarily believe that it's a singular thing. I think people have got lots of different selves within it. We, we have many different archetypes. Even as Jung yes. would say, is that there are so many archetypal channels via which we communicate. So I also agree with you. What is the true self? Hello? Yes. 
Yeah, exactly, exactly. But it kind of it just whatever they are, the market has a way, and trading has a way of exposing all of them, and oh. and they're kind of in an undeniable way. You know, like there they are, and you you can't keep. You know, well, I mean, a lot of people do con themselves for a long time, but you can't keep conning yourself for very long, really, and and maintain your sanity. No. You've got to deal with it. You've got no. to deal with it. This game forces you to be very honest with yourself about yourself. Yes. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. So, so, so that that that's de- definitely one of the things that I've also noticed. And one of you know, it's amazing how these quotes come to me when I'm talking. I never think of them beforehand. But one of the best things that I also learned, you know, and the, I, I think this applies to life, but also to trading, is some lessons cannot be taught; they must be lived in order for them to be understood. And I think the same goes goes for trading. You can't teach someone necessarily how to trade or how to make money, uh, it, especially not to make money. You know, you can you can mm-hmm. give them a set of tools, but teaching someone to trade is actually surprisingly difficult. You can teach them what to do, but you cannot cannot teach them necessarily how to do it because they need to find their way of doing it. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's a yeah. very random tinkering process, if I can call it that. Yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I think that's a really good way of, of framing it, actually, tinkering. Um, but I mean, the thing I think the thing that you can do a lot of the time, actually, is successfully in helping people is actually framing it around um, what not to do. Via you know, negativa, that's, think, that's yeah. A re- yeah. Yeah, there's a really good way to a really good way to start is to actually say, well, don't you know, don't do this because, don't do this because, and a lot of the time you can you can show you can show people other people making that mistake and it can feel like they're living it almost like if you can tell a good story about that like exactly mm. like when we're watching films you know like why we like really, films exactly why we like films so if you can tell a convincing story about why you don't do this because this can happen um then i think that that's that's something that you can definitely teach uh, it, that it, it's a lesson that can be learned without experiencing it directly because you can feel to some to enough of an extent you can feel what the character the main character is feeling you know, within that, within that scenario. But I think actually, like you say, that the, the, what you do need to do is something that I just don't think you can copy anyone else. I don't, I don't think it is teachable. I just think mm-hmm. you can kind right. of, if you can teach people the things to keep them in the game for long enough that they, <laughs> that they can figure it out themselves, basically, is the way to go. I, yeah. I think you that's, have that's to it. find your own approach and you have to do the whole Bruce Lee approach, as I call it. Adopt the useful, reject the useless, add your own unique twist to it. I That's mean, it. have certain rules in place and certain standards that you would like to upkeep. But as you said, and I couldn't agree more, uh, more with you on this, is that don't copy other people, you know, because it's, it, you, you don't copy them in terms of your everyday life. So what makes you no. think you're going to copy them in terms of their trading? They develop what works for them. It's like, for example, Chris Idiel. I will never be as good a volatility trader as the guy is. Forget it. Mm-hmm. It's not going to happen. And you know yeah. what? I don't care. I can get very good at volatility trading. I can learn a lot from him and from guys like Jamie. You know, remember, remember Jamie Glancy, you know, yeah, yeah, these yeah. other guys. Mm-hmm. I can learn a lot from them and I can become much better at it. And I can pass on the knowledge like what I've been doing in the Discord group and stuff. But am I an expert in options? Fuck no. Absolutely not. I'm not an expert. And I hate using that word for anything because I just feel, I feel like a fraud if someone calls me mm-hmm. an expert in anything. And it's not because I want to berate myself, but it's just like what Niels Boer said, an expert is someone who has made every conceivable mistake in a very narrow field of study. And I just feel like such a fraud to even consider that I would have made every conceivable mistake in any field of study of my life as of this point where I'm right yeah. now. However, however narrow it might be. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 100% mate. And, and, and that's why I'm very careful. It's that even when someone phrases me as an expert, I cringe a bit and I'm like, thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, but I would say that I may be knowledgeable or maybe experienced an expert. Nah, I'm not even close to being one. <laughs> it also and keeps me humble. I have no humble. desire to be one. I have no desire to be one. No, no, no. But, no, but I find yeah. that it also keeps me humble. You know, humility, mm. I find, is one, of the, is one of the keys to surviving in this game in any game, but especially in this game, because the market has a way of literally busting you up as soon as you start getting cocky or cute with it. And it, yeah. and it, and it knows, have you noticed that somehow the market knows where, uh, and for lack of a better word, when you are starting to feel, yeah, I've got this. Yeah. Yeah. I think it does. I think it's, um, it's not that the market knows. No, no, it's no, just no, of that, course not. <laughs> 
you know yeah but it's like there's there's a general kind of you know when a trend is coming to an end when you and others are feeling euphoric about it and that is always the time to get out i read um i like brent donnelly brent donnelly's um stuff a lot and the way that he uh, he looks at things because he's kind of got a good mixture of of, of all of these things i mean because he's been doing it like i don't know 25 30 years something like that he's been an fx trader um so he's and he's written he's written a couple of books and the one thing that i, I really liked about it is the cheer hedge that when he was managing cheer managing hedge. a, a cheer hedge this is brilliant huh. so he what he used to do when he was working in this this team was was basically he was in he was in charge of the risk management okay so whenever he whenever he saw any of the traders like cheering and basically patting themselves on the back he immediately hedged their position huh. and the hedges always made money whoa yeah wow okay that is really 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 interesting huh I've, I've never heard of that concept before but it makes so much sense yeah i mean i think you see the same thing in the, the it's the same thing you see on like on fin twitter as well you know sentiments all going one way oh you know we're going to the moon this is it now you know let the bull market can't you know kind of commence or get going again all that sort of thing when everyone's getting really excited that they're doing really well you know and, and that is that is generally the best time to get the fuck out absolutely do you remember when i told you uh the story of how I came up with a whole black heart red spade um, name for my podcast and, and everything else. Um, yes. And pre- um, now in the movie Interstate 60, that this to build on to your point, by the way, there is a scene or where, uh, where the guy travels to this town called Banton and Banton uh, has got a massive drug uh, problem, but the drug that they use is euphoria. Funny enough. So, uh, so all the people who, who take euphoria are instantly addicted and they never come off it. In fact, they said that the withdrawal symptoms are so bad that, uh, you know, they're, they actually end up dying from it. But it, it but what they do is that they, they, they actually have these people hooked on the, these people hooked on euphoria. So they have the euphoria zone and the euphoria free zone. So the euphoria free uh, in the euphoria zone, these people are essentially in jail, but they, they work around town. They, they pick up uh, rubbish and clean up and so on and so forth. And at night they party until they drop, you know, just taking mm-hmm. euphoria until they, until they can't anymore. But that actually got me thinking that we, we are so susceptible to euphoria addictions, whether it's in, in stock markets or housing markets or crypto markets, any market, you know, it, it just shows you that if you look at this euphoric action, that's when things do become dangerous because it is highly addictive. Making money, uh, especially when it's, I don't, don't want to use the word easy, but when it feels easy, boy, does that become yes. addictive, doesn't it? Super yeah. addictive. And you don't, and it's very hard to come down from that high once you've uh, achieved it. Definitely. I think, uh, and we're probably finding a lot of people coming down from that high now as well after the last couple of years that we've had. Mate, I don't even want to know how massive the graveyard of wiped out traders and accounts has become over the last two weeks alone, especially with that yeah. nickel spike. And as I saw earlier today, a drop of 12%. So anyone who went long of that thing now, you know, is is taking a massive hit again. Uh, yeah. I mean, we saw it with oil, we saw it with the stock market, the crypto markets, this is not an environment to get cute with a market. It never is, no, again, this, but especially no, no, no. not. No, exactly. And, and this, again, is, is, where, is where the narrow focus comes into things. Because if you're the kind of person who, who likes shiny things, you know, shiny new things, oh, something's happening, I'll go over yeah. there and I'll trade this, then, you know, then you're not going to last. You're, it's it's going to catch you out. Because, you know, especially in commodities, especially in commodities. I mean, fortunately, I think nickel, I don't think too many people would have been in nickel. No, luckily not. Because it happened so fast. Mm. So, you know, and but it's oil. not really that easy to trade. But oil could have been one that really would have fucked some people over. Yeah, yeah, massively. I, I, you had that massive yeah. spike and then all the all the margin margin requirements increased. You know, for everyone across the whole, you know, not just like retail traders, like across the whole industry. You know, clearing houses are saying, no, you've got to post more margin because of all the volatility. Yeah, yeah. Um, so obviously people have to sell their positions to get out of it. And that's why we saw it come back down. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's not it's not a time, like you say, to be tourist, touristing around and trying out new things and going, oh, I'll just trade this market. Now. I'll uh, just move into this one. Look at GameStop too- last year. GameStop also, oh. right, uh, GameStop and what's the other one? AMC, AMC I believe. AMC, the, AMC, those AMC two is, is amazing. wiped out so many people i mean even yeah. fucking melbourne capital took a four was it a four or five billion dollar hit now yes they have more money at their disposal than we probably ever will have in our entire lifetimes 
and look how they yeah. got wiped out. You know, from well, they, to, they were arguably the whole reason it happened. Yeah, because they yeah, were yeah. sat there like a sitting duck. Yeah, literally, literally, and they're just no, I'm not closing this position. Not close. Okay, let's squeeze you even more. <laughs> look, look at what happened to them. So, so, so exactly, exactly that, um, mate, is that it just shows you don't get cute with the freaking market. You haven't yeah. got this. You are in a period where you're doing well, but as soon as you start thinking you've got this, ha, huh, that, that, that's when somehow the market starts turning up the heat and shows you, okay, or you think you've got this. Now let me show you what, what I've got. And yeah. you're not going to be capable of trading well under all circumstances. That doesn't matter who you are. I don't know a single person out there, regardless of how smart or how skilled, that does well under all market conditions. Maybe you do. Maybe you, 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 know, you know people like that. I, I don't. I'm just saying that openly. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know is, is, is the complete honest truth because I'm, I'm only just starting now to actually settle on a trading style. I've, I've kind of, my, my trading has been all over the place over the years. Mm. You know, I've tried short-term trading. I've tried, I've tried to trade like David does, which is just, to me, is just like a, an alien concept entirely, you know, to, to sort of, to, I, I can't sit there like he does. Like it can go up 5% and then go back down 5% and he doesn't bat an eyelid. You know? mm. Very, <laughs> very long term. I, very long term. But long I think term. That, that that's where, that's where risk tolerance and time frames come into play. And I think that's what Absolutely. FT71 also said. He said the most important aspect of your trading is one thing and that's your time frame. He said, that's what you yes. should ask yourself. What are you trading on? He said, whether you're doing an intraday scalping, intraday, you know, where you buy the open, sell the close, sell the close, buy the open, you, you know, wh wh whatever, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, he said, that is the single biggest thing you need to ask yourself. What time frame am I trading on? And how yep. many people do that? Not that many. No, no, not very many at all. Not very many at all. I always had this idea when I started out that I'd actually have three separate... Um, uh, three separate trading accounts where I'd have one, I'd, I'd kind of have different personalities in each one. This was like, yeah. this, this has never happened, but it was an idea that I had. Look at you, Jekyll. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, it, it wasn't, it was, it was Jekyll and Hyde and one other was the way that I had to figure it out. There was, Jekyll, Hyde and there was, Clyde. <laughs> there was going to be like the short, the short term trader who in my, in my mind was basically Del Boy, you know, wheeling and dealing, getting in and out the market, yeah, you know, yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. And then there was kind of more of the, the businessman who was looking very much at things like, okay, there's some profit to be made here, mm. but let's, let's work out the details and slow down a little bit. And that obviously was a slightly sort of like medium term, maybe swing, swing trading, I would probably say it most fit with. And then there was the kind of the, the portfolio manager. You know, and those were the three personalities that I was going to try and develop. And I foolishly believed back then that that was possible, that you could have, you know, that again, that, that mental capacity to have the, to hold all of those ideas and those different timeframes in your brain and act and actually act properly on them um, within the first sort of five years of being around markets. Um, you know, I think it is possible, but, you know, maybe another 15 years time I might get there, you know, something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's possible, but, yeah. but is it probable for that to happen? You see, that's... This that's the, the thing. kind of think... question that I'm asking myself, and, and I'm not being demeaning. I, I'm, I'm just literally no, no, no. I totally room. agree. Is it totally probable agree. for that? It's. I think it, it very much depends on what you're doing, you know, and how you set things up. Because if you think about it, it's possible for people to have different businesses, isn't it? Yeah, or yeah. With totally, different, totally, with totally different totally ideas same. and different yeah. things. So if you're able to sort of split that up enough over time, you know, and sort of say, well, yes, I'm, you know, I've got my sort of my, my longer term portfolio that I'm managing here. And then I've got my kind of short-term trading where I'm coming in, I'm focusing on one or two markets, you know, intraday. And then mm. I've got, you know, the kind of more of the swing trading things in between, but again, still trading um, rather than kind of investing, which is where I would look at the portfolio. Ah, side of things. Okay. So you're not looking at doing all three at exactly the same time, because I thought, no, damn, no, no. you know, that that would just be difficult to, to, well, and, uh, to be honest, it. if, I, if, yeah, I mean, if I'm honest, when I thought of it originally, that's exactly what I was thinking. You know, now now I've been able to kind of step back. Okay, that and okay. How so you're, you're sort of like looking at them as silos. Gotcha, mate. Okay, sorry, I, because I was thinking to myself, freaking hell, you want to take on a lot by doing all No, no, that was that was the idea exactly at the beginning. The that, that was the idea at the beginning, and I was going to develop all three of those sort of personalities. So this is how I thought of it at the same time. <laughs> yeah, Jekyll, Hyde, and Clyde. <laughs> <laughs> basically, basically, yeah. I mean, it was just it was ridiculous. You know, the ideas. The ideas that I had of my capabilities were way, way higher than the reality. Oh, of trust me, I've been there. I still do sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs>
but I've also learned to be a little bit a little bit kinder to myself when I don't reach those lofty goals as well you know I kind of when I haven't when I set those high standards sometimes there's stuff it's not it's not even standards it is goals you know that like oh I should be at this point by this time and all that sort of stuff it's pointless but once again pointless once again the key word the the biggest uh, uh, the biggest thief of joy is the word should yes yes that's a good yeah Spot. should and comparison you know comparison to where you think you might be it's like what you alluded to earlier why are you complaining because of the fact that life isn't the way you want it to be and it's uh, or you're hinkering to the good old days which weren't necessarily as good as you make them out to be as you as you yeah. pointed out from earlier yeah yeah that's it you, you, there's no doubt that you you filled it all i mean i think that's a lot of the time is how we actually look back at history you know is that there's a lot of it's airbrushed out you know mm. it's like there's a load of stuff that if you were actually living in it at the time would be really uh, relevant but when you look back on history all of that stuff the kind of the the, the bricks of it all you know and the, and the labor that went into building that time you know that's all kind of airbrushed away and all you see is the finished building totally mate but but this is what i was saying to someone um and, and this was on linkedin a, a long while ago you know there i we, we don't see it as much now but about two years ago you know the whole uh, slavery thing was what was really spoken of a lot you know t tearing down statues and this and that and mm. people calling mm. churchill a racist and a this and the that and the other and and, and i thought and, and i'm not always a fan of pierce morgan but pierce morgan actually went into a freaking tirade defending churchill saying you know you you you, you, how, how can you how can you say that this man is evil and that he should be cancelled and his statues should be removed how can i make him right you know because churchill definitely had many good attributes to him but like all of us he he also did some things that were pretty messed up maybe you know along the way yes. and, yep. and and what do you expect what do you expect from someone who has to make difficult decisions you think that the world is all sunshine and rainbows that every decision you make is going to have zero consequences or zero impact on any other people of course not especially not at that kind of level but one of the things but that that aside you know to give a bit of context one of the things that i said to someone who was going on about it is i said look i hear where you're coming from but if we were to have lived in those particular times, would we have been so different? Would yeah. we have really? I said, no, absolutely. I don't think we would have been so different. I said, and I said, we need to be very careful about the way we are judging our predecessors and our ancestors, because I bet you now that we are doing things in the year 2019, 2020, whenever it was, that will be deemed pretty messed up in maybe 20 or 30 years from now. Are we going to appreciate it when we are scolded by the next generation for not living up to their standards of virtue that that mm -hmm. uh, that they have set or that they feel we should have uh, abided by? I don't think so. So let's be a little bit more humble and thank these guys for making the mistakes and living through those things so that we don't have to, so that we actually know a bit better. So, and, you, and you put all of this on LinkedIn? I put all of that on LinkedIn. I'm not afraid to express my opinion in a very uh, concise and clear kind of way without trying to be polarizing or picking sides because that, that's also what, what I noticed. It's like calling people out uh, you know, for having those particular views is not always a good way to engage with them. But giving them a different... Point never. Of view, yeah, mm. exactly. But giving them a different point of view to consider... If they are as fucking intelligent as they like to think they are, puts them on the spot, it reframes the situation and it forces them to, to not necessarily adopt a new view, but at least acknowledge it. Yeah, at least acknowledge that there's an alternative view, whether or not they agree with it or anything else. Yeah, totally, totally. Yeah, I'm just, I imagine on LinkedIn, it probably went down like a lead balloon. That was what I was thinking. It did to an extent, but I actually got quite a few. But, uh, but, but the guy who posted that actually said, you know what? I never thought of it that way until you mentioned it. I said, "Well, I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad I could help, but yeah. I really, I really hope that more people will consider this. That being critical of those who came before us is not exactly a helpful strategy. It well, no, really you can't, isn't. Like you say, you can't judge them by today's standards. You know, it's no. an entirely, entirely different thing. I mean, even I, I think back to some of the things that I did when I was a when I was a kid. Some of the things I did and some of the things I said and all of that. And oh, like gosh. now, if I saw it, yeah, exactly." You know, nowadays it'd just be terrible, be ostracized, sent out, you know, re rejected from society. So, you know, 
I would, I, I, I would not be happy with myself for a lot of things. No, I yeah, said, exactly. And, and I bet you in 10 years from now, 15 years from now, I'm probably going to look at, oh, gosh, why did you say that stuff? Why did you think that stuff? But that's, yes. it's called growth. We're meant but, yeah. to screw up and we're meant to change and grow. And the same, I think, goes for the world of finance and trading and stuff. You're not just going to walk into this game and immediately know what the hell to do, how to do it, when to do it, and so on. You are going to screw up. You are going to make mistakes. And that's okay. Uh, okay, it, it, it's, it's not fun because you lose money when you make mistakes. But that's part of the process. What do you, what, what do you expect? Yeah, I mean, that is the same as anything. So anything. I mean, Jesus. Like when I was, when I, I mean, I'd likened the, the kind of the journey of learning Spanish. Like people said to me as well, and this is something I always always liked. Is that like, how was when that did you, for When you, did you become you know, learning fluent? a new language like that? It, I mean, for me, English honest, at the start, yeah. it was fun. It was fun, but at the same time, it was really difficult. You know, and it was like it was really hard to keep making those mistakes. And like sometimes you'd say things, and people were kind of laughing because it was a funny oh, thing. Oh, I went and, through that when I learned English. I mean, many yeah. people don't realize that, that English is not actually my first language. Um, but I, I was laughed at and made fun of, you know, for pronouncing certain words in a, I still probably do pronounce words in, in a funny way and all that. But you know what? I don't know. South Africa, mate. Yeah. But, but yeah, 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 true. Ha. <laughs> <laughs> you will that too. To. That, that, that too. But I, I probably do pronounce words in a weird way or, or my grammar is not always uh, spot on and all that. But you know what? I don't even care anymore because you know what the fuck I mean and what I'm saying, you know, don't be a pedantic yeah. prick. I'm not going to yeah. call you out uh, if you learn a new language and you don't use the, the, the terminology exactly as intended. Yep, exactly. Exactly. That was the thing. And they said, when I, when I was asked that question, like how long did it take you to become fluent? I kind of, I couldn't answer it because I didn't know. And I kind of, mm. the best way that I, that I exactly like you're saying that the best way that I kind of defined it at the time was like, well, I suppose it was after about a year where I, not that I, that I was fluent in what might be the academic sort of, you know, here's a stamp on a certificate to say mm. that you're fluent, but in the sense of what fluent actually meant, which was being able to communicate what I wanted to communicate in pretty much every situation. But I didn't, I couldn't remember after a year, roughly, I couldn't, I didn't really find myself in, in situations where I couldn't express what I wanted. Not in the right way. I wasn't yeah. using the right tenses, you know, but I could say like, if I wanted to say to someone like, you know, like I want to buy nails, you know, then I would like, I would work my way around the problem to kind of say, well, you know, if you've got a wall and you've got a hammer, you know, and you want to put a picture, what was the thing you need? You know, and kind of like, I could, yeah. so I could kind of redo it that way. And I figured that's probably where, where I would say I was sort of fluent after. It was probably about a year, year and a half. You know, people kind of, again, a lot of the expats would come over and this was sort of something I got so sick of was the, the kind of the Brits coming over to Spain. Oh, we're definitely going to learn Spanish. We definitely are. I'm like, you're fucking not. I know you're not. You're not. Cause it, <laughs> like they go, oh, yeah, we're going to go to lessons for like an hour a week, you know, or whatever. You know, we get every, That's you know. not enough, mate. You need no, to speak exactly. more I was frequently. Like, Jesus Christ, it took me a year of working six days a week, you know, 12 hours a day immersed in it to really say that I got to the point of being fluent. How many weekly lessons of an hour do you have to do to get to that kind of point? And obviously the fact that I was doing it so, so constantly as well meant that it was, you know, I was learning faster because the lessons were being reinforced faster. If you have a week in between where you don't say a word of Spanish, you know, you, you probably lose, I don't know, half an hour of that hour that you did just in trying to sort of recall what you learned the previous week. Well, exactly. So, exactly yeah, that, it mate. Doesn't, it doesn't work. You've got to check yourself into it. But, but also, you know, you, you touched on something really interesting over here is that I learned this principle from a book that I read many years ago. And when I first read this, I thought, what the fuck are you on about? But he said one six times uh, uh, one. No, actually, one times six is better than six times one. And I was like, huh? And then he said one hour a day. And six times a week is better than six hours a day once a week yeah I'm like ah and that and, and that that to me is one of the key things that i try to apply to when i want to become good at something it's that doing six hours a day uh, once a week is not going to do much for you if it's anything. like exercise it's like exercise yeah it? totally 100 percent that and you don't even need to have an hour a, a, a day every day but at least doing it more consistently over a longer period has a lot more volume than doing it once every once in a while. Yeah, yeah, absolutely that, absolutely that. And I think that's, 
that's also sort of how I found the again I, I like the learning curve as as it's known. You know, this kind of learning curve isn't actually a curve at all. You know, it's it's I I saw it much more as a kind of as a stepping um, sort of process. You know, that 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 sort of so you kind of I found that it kind of you were plateaued for a period of time, and then all of a sudden the pieces seemed to fall into place, and you kind of you jumped up a level. And then you'd kind of plateau again for a while, and then you'd jump a level again, and you'd plateau, and so on. You know, like well, a step, yeah. like a stepping thing. And that's how I felt. How I found learning about trading. That's how I found learning learning Spanish. That's how I've you know pretty much everything relatively complex. You know that you're. It's not a learning curve. It's a le- it's a stepping process. You know, sometimes you've got to take a step back as well to try to unlearn some things that you thought you knew but you didn't. Oh, gosh, I still do. Yeah, that's it. But yeah, it's definitely not a constant thing. It's not a curve in any shape or form. And it's not a diagonal line, you know, straight up and to the right. It doesn't, it just, it doesn't work like that. No, Anything no. you're learning doesn't work. No, like no, that. no, definitely not. And, and, and I mean, I was actually, I'm busy with a book called Extreme Ownership by a guy called Jocko Willink. I don't I've know read this. Heard. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a good pretty book. good book, good isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's actually quite mm. good. And, uh, you know, during one of his podcasts, because I like listening to him every now and again, um, you know, when he when he has interesting guests on. And he, He's and he very intense, this, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, very intense. That su- success and failure, you know, that, that voice that, that, <laughs> That he does, but but it's so yeah. it's so hypnotic when you listen to his voice because he, he he seems so authoritative yet so sincere at the same time. You almost can't help listening to him, you know, where when where, whenever he speaks. But he mm-hmm. said something really interesting that success and failure are generally slow processes. He said you're either slowly building things up or gradually tearing them down, and I think. That is why so many people, myself included, when I was younger, struggle to stick with things, you know, struggle to, to stick it out because we, we, we are so, gear, so uh, conditioned to think that, oh, I need to feel motivated. I need to feel motivated to do this. I need to feel motivated to do that. But here's the fucking problem with motivation. Motivation, if I can use an analogy, is the spark that lights a fire. But mm-hmm. discipline is the gas it keeps it burning so yeah that's a good analogy that's yeah that's spot on that's exactly what i found as well and it's it's also as well i think is the um you can kind of think of it in the sense as well of having of trying to keep one fire going yeah rather than trying to go off and sort of and let one fire go out and then go and light another one and then go off and you know and then like constantly looking and sort of starting new fires yeah that's that's i mean from a strategic perspective of, of trading that's where that's where i really that's where I really fucked up early on and for, for a long time. Oh, you know, let's I was try this looking for oh, the next. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always, always. I'll just look for this thing. Oh, maybe if I do this instead. Oh, no, I'll try that instead. And it's, um, it's so easy. Yeah, actually, to... I, like, I like the Bruce Great. Lee quote for that. You know, the man, I fear the man who's practiced one kick 10,000 times. Oh, that one. brilliant. I yeah. love that. I love that quote. He was actually such a wise guy, wasn't he? I mean, for, yeah. for, for you know, I, I, I don't know overly much about him, but. I would argue that he was probably an even better philosopher than he was a fighter. If you look, if you look at the fact that he wrote that book called The Tao of Jeet Kune Do, mm-hmm. it's, yeah. it's, it's actually quite remarkable. I mean, we could argue that Mike Tyson is also a pretty good philosopher. <laughs> As you said the other day, you know, that, that whole everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Uh, don't listen to this, Mike. Please don't hit me. <laughs> yeah. But uh, but but he's also right though. I mean, fighters often have this the, these incredible philosophical aspects to them. It's like the guy uh, called Elio Gracie, who who founded uh, who co-founded Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. And, and he said um, something to two guys that he, that he had just graded up to first level degree black belts. And they, they asked him, you know, why did you grade us so quickly? He said, well, first of all, because you deserve it. And because uh, you, you leveled up a lot quicker. He said, for example, it, it, this isn't school where you have to be held back just because you progress a lot quicker than the other students. Why should you? Why should I hold you back? And then, mm-hmm. and then they asked him, but what about the degrees? Is that our fighting ability? He said, no, a degree to me is the equivalent of rubbish. He said, I give, I give meaning to these degrees that I give you. You give meaning to the degrees. He said, besides in Rio, I'm a blue belt. So what, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing over there. And this is a guy who's got a 10th degree red belt. He was in his nineties at that particular point in time. I mean, he founded the fucking art 
And he said, and he said, a fighter has a time. A teacher has a lifetime. He said, at one point, I was one of the best fighters in the world. Now I'm nothing. And so what? It doesn't matter. But, but, but I think that is a very key distinction to make over here is that if you want to be a great fighter, be prepared for one thing. You're going to have a time, but you're not going to have a lifetime. But as a teacher, you can have a lifetime. And, and that to me was like, wow, what a freaking revelation in terms of approaching different things, you know, whether it's trading or whether it's, uh, uh, you know, business consulting or philosophy or whatever, you know, you're often better off being a teacher than trying to be the best fighter or the best performer. I mean, it's great being the best performer, don't get me wrong, but how long are you going to be the best if that's all that matters to you? Sorry, I rambled there, but I, it just... No, no, yeah, you, hang on. Yep, yeah, you are. I mean, and again, it's, it's, it's the comparison to others as well rather than the comparison to yourself, isn't it? Mm, mm, totally, totally. I mean, yeah, Whew, all this phil philosophical talk, I feel all yeah, fired deep, up getting and deep. <laughs> very, very deep. But, but I love it, though, because, because the thing yeah. is, though, I don't have that many people with whom I can talk to at this level. And that's one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that you don't mind to 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 the two of us having this conversation it's as natural and as easy as breathing it doesn't feel like an yeah. effort so it's no not at all not at all and but yeah I know, I know what you mean it's like sometimes you're talking to people and you you know that you've got a it's not gonna it's not gonna end up being in a deep conversation you know and you sort of you, you've got to struggle to find some common ground sometimes so you what's know, the weather like? like? <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Yeah, I cringe. If I ever feel myself in like small talk situations saying one of those cliche things, I'm just cringing inside again. Mate, please I suck at small talk. Back to me. Please say something interesting back to me so we can go somewhere else with this. Yeah. Oh, no, no, God, I'm, terrible. I, I'm terrible at small talk. You know, it's, 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 it's actually quite staggering to see how bad at it that I am because I, yeah. I really try sometimes, but I, I actually start feeling awkward. And then people think I'm a, an awkward person, but it's like, no, I just don't know what the fuck to talk about. No, about I, I had like, that's it. I had like five things. When I was doing this date agency before, obviously you had to start with small talk. Mm, so mm, I would, mm. and gen generally my, my kind of go-to thing was always just to ask them about them. That was the best way to do it. So, you know, Good how long point. have you been looking? You know, where are you, where, you know, where are you from? Where are you from? You know, sort of just try and try and get things going. Like, you know, how did this all start? You know, there's, there's always a good one, you know, really open question. Yeah. And then just let them talk. That was, I found that was much better than me trying to make small talk. It actually, even, even this, like the, the kind of, when we talked about the podcast, you know, and mm. you said, like, that don't think of it as like an interview or anything like that. I was kind of yeah. really grateful because I feel different when I'm on the, on the podium. You know, just so a chat speak, between two friends. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But if someone says I'm going to interview you, then it's like, oh my god, I've got to be, oh, I'm going to be interviewed. That means that there's a version of me that I've got to, I've got to show. And no, yeah, I can't. No, no, I can't, yeah, can't, I, no. I, I mean, I don't, I don't I, feel I'm, like, I'm I don't think that. But it's kind yeah. of, it's, a, it's always a, there's a feeling there, like no, no, a no, different thing. Is there a conversation and an interview are two different things? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's the observer effect. Um, I, I don't know if you're familiar with the observer effect. No, you mentioned it. No, I, I've heard of it, but I'm not actually, it's, I can't think what it is. So, so the observer effect is actually, shockingly enough, mate, even found at the atomic level. Um, so the observer effect, in, in essence, you know, I'm, I know I'm going to fuck up the whole quantum mechanical proper definition of it, but in very layman's terms, it means that particles uh, or beings behave differently when they become aware of the fact that they are being observed. And they, and they can actually be behave differently when they're not consciously aware of the fact that they're being observed. So they're unconsciously aware, but not necessarily consciously. And quantum mechanic, um, what, what, what would you call them? Quantum physicists, I presume, uh, I presume is the correct terminology over here, found that even atoms behave differently when they're being observed directly by them versus when they're not being observed. I was like, what the flying fuck? That even atoms could behave differently. So, it, it, I mean, now we're getting very deeply into a, into a philosophical topic here. But I wonder, you know, just from this perspective that I just mentioned, if markets could actually behave very differently when a lot of people are watching them versus when a lot of people are not watching them. Hmm. I mean, now we're getting really freaking deep. And, and yeah, obviously, thinking, there's I'm no answer about watching to that. Versus but... participating. I'm thinking about sort of so, so when. When you've got like a, 
widespread participation, like perhaps we saw when everyone was locked down, I think is probably mm. the best the best way you can you could sort of take that because because watching doesn't have any in theory at least watching does it shouldn't have any impact on the market. No, no, in theory, because not, the market not. is actual transactions that you're yeah. seeing there. So the act, yeah. the act of people watching it doesn't make any difference. And if, yeah, it's but at the same time, more attention, the more it moves, and the more there's the more excitement, the more people are participating, then the more uh, the more attention is drawn to it. So I suppose it comes into effect then. So it's, I think it's a, observation is like a function of participation. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, because what they actually found with those atoms is, is that it would actually start spinning in more erratic manners or in different directions when they're being observed. Quite, quite astounding. I, I mean, I, I, like, we've already been on for a while, so I, I, dread to, I dread to actually ask this, but how do they know? How could they possibly know that they behave differently versus when they're being watched versus when they're not? That is something that also baffled me, you know, but, but this, was, this was passed on to me by a friend who works, who is a computer engineer and electrical engineer and all that stuff. I mean, so he, he showed me, he, he told me about these things that they, that they were discussing, you know, um, as, as part of the whole course and stuff. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, how, how could they know, as you rightfully said, are, are being observed versus not being observed? I guess it was being recorded by something, you know, so maybe maybe I mean, i'm just guessing over here at the atomic level the 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 direct observation under that microscope was noted when a person viewed it versus when it was just being recorded by an inanimate object that's my best guess over here in terms of how they could notice the differences hmm. okay. but okay. it does it does make you think doesn't it you know in terms of you know like if even atomic particles are aware of observation and, and how we how we behave it just shows you why we behave so differently when we are aware of the fact that we are being watched like on a podium or uh, aware that we are being watched via or listened to via podcast your body language might be a bit different your tonality of your voice the, the, the choice of words might, might actually be very different to the way you would act when you're not um, aware of being observed or at least uh, when you're not being observed in the first place yeah, yeah, I think that does that does make a lot a lot of sense that that would be the case. I fucking hope so because otherwise I'm yeah. way off track. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I mean that, that the whole thing makes a lot of sense. To just the, the thing about the atoms is the thing is just blown my mind. But the that, that like, but the first thing is how, how, like, how close are they observing them? Like, could it be that by observing them they're getting too close to the atoms and there's some kind of thing going on? Magnetic field because we have a yeah, magnetic field ourselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of thing that they're influencing the atoms that way rather than it actually being that the atoms behave differently from observation. It's just the proximity. Oh, that's why quantum physics is such an an open field and you have to have an incredibly open mind i mean quite honestly i don't consider myself smart enough to really delve into the world of quantum physics and mechanics. that's very closed-minded of you ah oh oh you ah, smacked me hard with that got it ah. got it <laughs> good one damn you really got me there okay i i, I admit it that that was a punch in the mouth you really you <laughs> <laughs> Mike would be proud. <laughs> he would be he would be absolutely proud of you for that one. That was a good one, Tim. <laughs> but but yeah, but yeah, you're right. Um, you know, how do I know that I'm not smart enough for it? Well, let's say I don't feel smart enough to really yeah. delve into it with, with, with a sense of authority and knowledge, so to speak. No, and there's and there's probably some truth, some truth in there that there's, you know, that maybe you haven't been interested in it for long enough to actually really go and make a make an impact in it perhaps is the uh yeah you know yeah. i think sometimes those feelings do do there is truth behind them you know you can you can trust some feelings i, I know i wouldn't be any good at it because i'm just not rigorous enough in the kind of process that i that i do i could do it there's lots of things that we all could do but mm. i think once after a while you know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and what they fit more versus what they don't Oh gosh, I mean, I barely, I, I barely even grasp a, a lot of options, mechanics, and mathematics, and we haven't, I haven't even delved into uh, re, uh, or rather, um, reciting the Black Scholes model from scratch and all that stuff. I mean, I'm not even going into that. So I, I feel, for instance, that is more than enough to keep me occupied for a while. <laughs> Quantum mechanics, I'll leave that to other people to figure out. You know, I'll, I'll read about yeah. it, but I won't actually go and delve into it. Yeah, I think that's uh, yeah, that's that's a good way to do it. Just just get a little bit of knowledge, just bring in a little bit, have a surface level sort of understanding, and then and then move on. 
I mean, gosh, uh, trading is already a form of quantum mechanics in, in its own right, if you ask me. You know, we have psychology in the mix. We have, we have uh, technology. We have, um, gosh, what, what is it? Uh, economic fundamentals. We have wars, politics. Good Lord, it, it is a form of quantum mechanics, you know, in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know if it's quantum mechanics is the right way, but definitely there's a hell of a lot that goes into it. I mean, that's, that's sort of the thing with the, um, with macro that we mm. that kind of, when we did, ma- you know, macrodesia name, we talked about changing it once, you know, to try and yeah, figure why, out. You why know, why didn't you guys do and go ahead with it? Didn't find a good alternative. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, we may, maybe we'll do one day, but it was just, it's just like a conversation at the time to sort of uh. see if there was a better name. And it's sort of like, and then we were kind of diving into what does macro really mean? And it's like, it's not macroeconomics. That wasn't what we, what it really was. No. It wasn't macroeconomics. Macro is the study of everything, you know, yeah. and it is, it is basically like all of those inputs come under the sort of the, the, the umbrella of macro, but we didn't really know whether or not that was, uh, you know, whether people would understand it that way. Yeah, just so don't just use it as a conversation. Yeah, just don't yeah. use it as a conversation starter on a date. Oof, women no, love that stuff. Mm-mm. <laughs> Standard deviations yeah. and uh, CPI figures. Yeah, they love it. <laughs> actually, I'll, I'll just explain to you how inflation actually works. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No chance. No chance. <laughs> oh, fuck, I love it. Absolutely love it. You know what, mate? Um, I had, th- this is without a doubt, one of the best conversations that I've ever had. I mean, thank you so much Thanks, for, yeah, for uh, giving me the time. It, it, it's such a pleasure. I, I hope we can actually do this, um, you know, with, with a few more participants involved, you know, like a similar kind of conversation where we just shoot the breeze, so to speak, the way we did and get some other views. Yeah. Well, I, I yeah, don't why know not? how you feel about that. I'm up for that, mate. Absolutely. Yeah, I would actually love that. So th- as I said, thanks a lot. You know, I really appreciate it. And I'm going to have this uploaded very, very shortly. And uh, I, I hope that everyone listening to this is going to enjoy it as much as I have. Definitely, definitely, without a doubt, one of the best ever. So thank you for making that happen. Thank you, mate. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Perfect. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to stop recording. And uh, yeah, give me one second. And